Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much uh, for joining us for our 2022 annual conference. Um, I say annual, I think it was only nine months since the last one, but this is our regular slot, which we're going to try and move back to. Um, it's been an exciting year at uh, 24 old buildings. We have a new head of chambers, uh, Elspeth Talbot Rice QC, who many of you will know, uh, who started as our head of chambers in spring of this year, taking over from Alan Steinfeld, who uh, all of you will know, who has been our head of chambers for as long as I can remember, I think since the last millennium. Um, uh, so uh, that's been an exciting new change for us. We've also got, uh, since uh, you're all last here, three new tenants, uh, one of which I think is going to speak to you today. I hope all three of whom are going to be around. Uh, Harry Samuels, Jess Clark-Jones and Charlie Strachan uh, now all um, will feel like they've been in practice for a lifetime, but it's only actually nine months. We also decided a few days ago to recruit our three current pupils, so there'll be three more new tenants from the 1st of October, um, and hopefully they'll be here to, to say hello to you too. Bethany Chambers, James Kahn, uh, James Kane and uh, Rachel Carver. So um, six new uh, tenants for Chambers to uh, build on the strength uh, that we've had for so many years. Um, as you all know, this is our commercial conference. Um, we have three regular conferences every year. The Geneva Conference, our longest running one, normally held in September in Geneva, of course, um, to which uh, many of you would have come before and to which we're all uh, warmly invited and our probate private client conference which um, is held, heard, held early in the summer so I think it was last month we held that this year so those are our three flagship events and that is because we like to showcase the full range of our work as a chancery commercial set we're very proud that we keep uh, our, our hand in and expertise in, in, in the full range of commercial chancery areas of law, including aviation and arbitration, uh, but also trusts, probates, estates work, uh, commercial litigation, of course, um, company and insolvency work, partnership, civil fraud, financial services, and also art law. So between those three conferences, we hope we cover all the bases. Um, those six new tenants that I've mentioned will have to get to grips with all of those areas and have uh, had exposure to all of them in, in pupillage, of course, as you all know, as we carry on through our practices normally by accident we end up specializing in one or other of those fields or one or more of those fields our international work is is expanding the uh, uh, resumption of international flights means that we I suspect will be traveling as much as we were pre COVID soon but at the moment everything seems to be on zoom when it's international um, in the last year there have been huge cases conducted by members of chambers in Bermuda, in the BVI, in Cayman, uh, as well as the usual string of cases in Guernsey, Jersey, uh, Gibraltar, uh, of course the Middle East, Dubai and Abu Dhabi in particular, and the Far East, um, and recently Francis Tregeer um, was uh, also acting in an American case uh, as an expert on English law. Um, so our work continues apace. Uh, we're looking forward to uh, another gr year of growth um, and building on all the expertise and experience which our, our members have developed uh, over the decades. Um, today uh, we've got an exciting selection of talks for you on various different uh, issues. Uh, they've all been framed as questions at my request because we thought that might uh, pique your interest. Um, we've also got an exciting selection of drinks to be uh, served after the talks today so I hope you can all uh, stay for that. There will be um, an opportunity for questions, but the way we're going to organize it is for all questions to any of the speakers to be saved until the end. That's just in the uh, very unlikely event that people overrun today, uh, then we will dispense with questions in favor of drinks, and you can ask your questions privately to the, to the speakers. So I'm going to hand over to uh, Emma. This was going to be a talk which Emma and Daniel were going to give jointly. Daniel has been brought down by COVID. Um, and so like the excellent junior she is, Emma is standing in for her leader and giving the talk alone. Uh, it's an exciting talk about um, what transactions as an undervalue mean and when it can be said that somebody has entered into a transaction as an undervalue talk, which I think um, Liz Weaver and I gave years and years ago, it's now going to be updated with uh, more appropriate and uh, opportune law. Anyway, thank you very much for coming and I'll hand over to Emma. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, 
So today I'm going to be talking to you about an important feature of the clawback provisions in sections 238, 339 and 43 of the Insolvency Act 1986. That important feature, which has received quite a bit of judicial attention in some recent cases, is the question of what constitutes entering into a transaction. I know that many of you will be very familiar with these statutory provisions, but for those of you who were less so, I will first be giving you a very brief overview of each provision and the most important common elements across the board. The context for all of this is the enforcement of claims by creditors, including those through insolvency procedures. Now, obviously, in an ideal world, if your client has a financial claim against someone, you hope that if you win and then come to enforce that claim, that the judgment debtor will have more than enough assets to pay. The picture on the slide is, a ch is of a chest full of gold. It's obviously, uh, it's metaphorical. It's intended to represent the pot of assets that judgment creditors would like to enforce against. I'm sorry to say that I've yet to come across a case where a judgment debtor has actually had a full chest of gold, but with inflation levels as they are, who knows what the future may hold. Unfortunately, it is a fact of life that judgment debtors' metaphorical treasure chests tend to look a bit more like the picture in this slide when you come to enforce your judgment against them. You can, of course, bankrupt an individual or seek to wind up a company if they can't pay their debts, but if the judgment debtor has no assets, then that won't do you much good. But what if you discover that at some point previously, the judgment debtor did have valuable assets, but chose to dispose of them for no consideration or an inadequate consideration? Now that is where the clawback provisions in the Insolvency Act may be of assistance. Starting with section 238, which is now on the slide, this applies to insolvency, insolvent companies which are either in administration or in liquidation. An application under Section 238 can only be brought by an administrator or a liquidator of an insolvent company. You will see on the slide from the words highlighted in red that there are numerous references to the insolvent, insolvent company entering into a transaction. That is the first precondition that must be satisfied before the court can grant relief under this provision. And it is the meaning of that phrase, enters into, which is the focus of my talk today. There is also a requirement that the relevant transaction must have been at an undervalue. And that is defined by subsection four as a gift, a transaction that provides for the company to receive no consideration or a transaction where the value of the consideration provided to the company is significantly less than the value provided by the company. If the company has entered into a transaction at an undervalue, then the court's jurisdiction to make a remedial order against an immediate or subsequent recipient is engaged, provided that that transaction occurred at a relevant time. Essentially, this means the period up to two years prior to the onset of, insol in, of insolvency, but only if the company was already insolvent at that time or became so as a result of the impugned transaction. It is not necessary to establish any particular mental state on the part of the company for a transaction to be caught by Section 238, but there is a potential defence under Subsection 5 for transactions entered into by the company in good faith where there were reasonable grounds to believe that the transaction would benefit the company. This defence might apply, for example, in the case of fire sale of the company's assets, which might have been intended to generate cash to keep the company's business going in times of restricted cash flow. Section 339, which is now on the screen, contains equivalent provisions in cases of bankrupt individuals. Again, this provision can only be invoked by the office holder in a formal insolvency procedure. Again, there is a threshold requirement that the bankrupt has entered into a transaction. There is then a very similar definition of undervalue, which includes an additional limb to cover transactions entered into in consideration of marriage or the formation of a civil partnership. Obviously, there is no need for such a provision in Section 238 because companies cannot get married or form civil partnerships. 
There is also a requirement that the transaction occurs at a relevant time. And the definition of relevant time in this context is a bit more complicated than that which applies in Section 238. Es essentially, time goes back up to five years prior to the date of the making of the bankruptcy application, which resulted in that person's bankruptcy. In the most recent two years of that period, transactions are caught whether or not that person was insolvent at the time or became insolvent as a result of that transaction. In the earlier period before that, it is necessary to prove that the person was insolvent already at the time of the transaction or became so as a result of it. It is also worth noting that there is no equivalent for bankrupt individuals of the defence that we've just seen in the corporate context under Section 238, Subsection 5. Lastly, now on the screen, we have Section 423, which can apply to any debtor, whether they are a company or an individual. At Subsection 1, we have the familiar requirement that the debtor has entered into the transaction at an undervalue. However, in cases of Section 43, rather than imposing a timing requirement, there is instead a requirement under subsection 3 that the debtor has to have entered into the relevant transaction for the purposes of putting assets beyond the reach of creditors or otherwise prejudicing the interests of such, such a creditor in relation to the claim he is making or may make. Another important distinctive feature if, of Section 243 is that any victim of the transaction has standing to bring a claim under, under the section, and they can do so even where the debtor is not in an insolvency procedure. Although office holders also have standing to seek relief under Section 43 if the debtor is in an insolvency procedure. So in summary, we have three common requirements across all of the provisions we've just been looking at. In each case, the relevant person, whether that be an insolvent company under Section 238, a bankrupt individual under Section 339, or a debtor under Section 423, must enter into a transaction at an undervalue. The statute includes a somewhat obscure definition of transaction at Section 436, where it is defined to include a gift, agreement, or arrangement. And the defini definition goes on to say that references to entering into a transaction shall be construed accordingly. The Court of Appeal has also confirmed in a case called National Bank of Kuwait and Menzies that decisions interpreting the scope of these, those elements in one provision are applicable across all three. So it's a fair assumption that a case interpreting the enter into requirement under section 238 will equally apply to sections 339 and 43 as well. So what does enter into mean in this context? You might think that, an that answer to that question would be straightforward, but experience has proven otherwise. The issue has arisen in three particular contexts in the case law, which are as follows. First, cases of misappropriation of assets from the debtor or insolvent person by a third party. Second, the sale of assets by a mortgagee exercising a power of sale. And third, the disposal of assets owned by a company which is in turn owned or controlled by the debtor or insolvent person. So what about misappropriation of assets? This is the one point where I can give you a definitive answer this afternoon because the Court of Appeal has confirmed that a person does not enter into a transaction if their assets are misappropriated by a third party without the owner's knowledge or consent. The case which establishes that proposition is a case called Hunt and Hosking, which was a claim brought by the liquidator of a company under Section 238. It didn't literally involve a thief dressed up like the picture on the slide, but the liquidator in Hunt and Hosking basically alleged that the company's accountant had stolen some money from the company in the two-year period prior to its insolvency. The liquidator then brought a claim under Section 238 against the accountant and also against another person who had received company assets from the accountant. The liquidator's claim was struck out at first instance and the decision was upheld by the Court of Appeal. Lord Justice Kitchen, as he then was, drew attention to the fact that the need to prove that a transaction had been entered into by the company 
was a distinct statutory requirement under Section 238. He said that this expression connotes the taking of some step or some act of participation by the company. Now, the quotation is on the slide. As Lord Justice Kitchen points out, there is no difficulty where an agent enters into a transaction on behalf of the relevant insolvent person or debtor. Now that must be right, as a company can only ever act through its agents, most usually its directors. But insofar as the company was a victim of the misappropriation of assets, which was not authorised by the company, the company plainly did not participate in any transaction, so the requirements of Section 238 were not satisfied and the claim was struck out. Now, this was a very important decision because it demonstrated the importance of giving separate consideration to the entry into requirement under Section 238, as applies equally uh, in cases under Section 339 and 423. Now, that point was also reinforced by Lord Justice Elias. He rejected the submissions of counsel for the liquidator that Section 238 should be construed so as to include misappropriation of assets, essentially on policy grounds, because in counsel submission, the purposes of Section 238, namely to protect creditors of an insolvent company, would be better served by that outcome. Now, Lord Justice Elias acknowledged that that might be so, but he said that he could see no legitimate way in which Section 238 can be construed so as to achieve that result. In other words, the court does not have an unfettered discretion to construe these clawed back provisions in the insolvency legislation so as to give maximum conceivable protection to creditors. The court ultimately has to give effect to the words that Parliament chose to use in the statutory provisions themselves. Now, as I said, a case of misappropriation is relatively straightforward to deal with. But what about a mortgagee's exercise of a power of sale in respect of a debtor's assets? By contrast, in these cases, uh, the courts have, have, have proven to uh, deal with them somewhat inconsistently. In one case called Re Brabon, which I'll be talking about in a moment, the court found emphatically that a sale by a mortgagee was not entered into by the bankrupt for the purposes of Section 339. By contrast, in another case called Fekins, which was actually decided by the same judge, the court found in equally emphatically that a debtor had entered into a transaction for the purposes of Section 423 in circumstances where a mortgagee had exercised its power of sale in respect of the debtor's property. But the Fekins case made it quite clear that the relevant transaction that had been entered into was not the sale of the property itself, but instead an informal and somewhat dishonest arrangement between the debtor and the eventual purchaser. So a great deal will depend on identifying what the relevant transaction was in any particular case, rather than focusing purely on the actual transfer of an asset by a mortgagee exercising its power of sale. In the Brabon case, Mr. Brabon owned some land which was earmarked for residential development. The land had been subject to a mortgage in favour of Nationwide, and Mr. Brabon's wife obtained an assignment of the charge from Nationwide so that she became the mortgagee. Mr. Brabon then exchanged a contract of sale to sell his land to a property developer called Silver. Before the sale of the land could be completed, a bankruptcy order was made against Mr. Brabon. Thereafter, Mrs. Brabon, exercising her power of sale as mortgagee, then completed the sale of the land to Silver. Mr. Brabon's trustee in bankruptcy brought an application under Section 339 alleging that the sale of the property to Silver had been at an undervalue. Following a trial, Mr. Justice Jonathan Parker, as he then was, dismissed the Section 339 application, primarily on the basis that Mr. Brabon had not entered into the transaction by which the land was sold to Silver. Mr. Justice Jonathan Parker reasoned that if Nationwide had been the mortgagee and had transferred the property to Silver by exercising its power of sale, then it would have been impossible to equate that transaction with a transfer by Mr. Brabon. He found that a transfer affected by Mrs. Brabon in her capacity as a mortgagee was no different. So Mr. Brabon had not entered into a transaction under Section 339. Now, you might think that this was a slightly surprising result, given that Mr. Brabon had, 
after all, actually agreed to sell the land to Silver in the first place, and he had entered into a binding contract which could presumably have been specifically enforced by Silver had it wished to do so. The next case in this line of authority is the decision of the Court of Appeal in Fekins and Defra. That case concerned a farmer called Mr. Fekins. He owned the freehold of some farmland. The farmland was subject to an agricultural tenancy in favour of a company. At one point, that company had been owned by Mr. Fekins himself, but by the time of the events in question, the company was actually owned by his daughter. The freehold of the farm was subject to a mortgage in favour of NatWest for about £450,000. Sorry, 400000 Sadly, Mr. Fekins experienced some financial difficulties. He had been in some litigation against the government department that became DEFRA, and DEFRA had, had obtained a judgment against him for about 650000 which it had enforced by way of a charging order against the farm. Then matters got even worse for Mr. Fekins when a foot and mouth case was diagnosed at the farm and DEFRA carried out what the head note describes as a lengthy and invasive series of measures at the farm, including the slaughter and disposal of all the cattle and sheep, hence the picture of the burning cows on the slide. The only glimmer of hope in Mr. Fekins' life at this point is that he had begun a romantic relationship with a lady called Miss Hawkins. Then Mr. Haw Mr. Fekins and Miss Hawkins agreed on a cunning plan to solve all of his, his financial problems, or, or so they thought. On the basis of a genuine independent valuation of the freehold of the farm subject to the agricultural tenancy, um, the, the, the valuation was that it was worth about £450,000 subject to the tenancy, which would not leave much left over after the re repayment of the loan to Nationwide. Sorry, NatWest this time. However, the value of the freehold of the farm without the agricultural tenancy was far higher. It was more like £1 million. Mr. Fekins, without revealing the true nature of his relationship with Ms. Hawkins, introduced Ms. Hawkins to NatWest as a potential arm's length purchaser for the freehold of the land. He was prepared to pay £450,000 to buy the farm subject to the agricultural tenancy. NatWest was ultimately persuaded to exercise its power of sale as a mortgagee to sell the freehold of the farm to Ms. Hawkins for £450,000 with the result that NatWest's mortgage was paid off in full and DEFRA's charge was overreached. Then came the best part of the plan. Mr. Fekins, as he had previously agreed with Ms. Hawkins, got the company which was owned by his daughter to surrender the agricultural tenancy. This meant that Ms. Hawkins now owned a mortgage-free property worth about £1 million when she had only paid £450,000 for it. Now, NatWest was happy because the mortgage had been paid off in full, and Miss Hawkins was happy because she had paid £450,000 for a property uh, worth a considerably higher sum. And Mr. Fekins was also happy because he, as he had planned, then married Miss Hawkins and believed that they could now live happily ever after at the farm. So they off went on, on holiday together to Australia. But unfortunately for them, when they came back, they arrived home to discover that DEFRA was not so happy with what had happened and had commenced proceedings under Section 423. At trial, Mr. Fekins, relying on Reed Brabon, defended the claim on the basis that he had not entered into any transaction. He had not entered into the sale of the farm to Miss Hawkins because that had been that West exercising its power of sale as mortgagee. He had not entered into a release of the agricultural tenancy that had been done by the company which was owned by his daughter. The trial judge rejected these arguments, finding that the relevant transaction that Mr. Fekins had entered into for the purposes of Section 43 had instead been his arrangement with Ms. Hawkins. The Court of Appeal dismissed Mr. Fekins' appeal against that finding. Now, the leading judgment on this issue uh, was given by none, none other than Lord Justice Jonathan Parker, who you may recall had been the trial judge in Rue Brabourne. You might think, given the approach taken there, that Lord Justice Jonathan Parker would have allowed the appeal. But if that is what you were thinking, then you would be wrong. He went on to distinguish his previous decision in Rue Brabourne, holding that the relevant transaction was not the actual disposal of the property, but the prior arrangement between Mr. Fekins and Miss Hawkins. 
On that basis, Lord Justice Jonathan Parker held that Mr. Feekins had indeed entered into a transaction, the effect of which was to cause Miss Hawkins to receive the freehold of the farm. That transaction had been at an undervalue because the purchase price paid by Miss Hawkins uh, did not take into account Mr. Feekins' ability to procure the surrender of the agricultural tenancy. As Mr. Feekins' purpose in entering into this arrangement with Ms. Hawkins was plainly to put assets beyond the reach of creditors, the elements of Section 423 were satisfied. So the Feekins case is authority for the proposition that the mere fact that the debtor's property is actually transferred pursuant to the exercise of a power of sale or by a mortgagee does not necessarily mean that the debtor has not entered into a relevant transaction. It will all depend on identifying the relevant transaction in any given case. Now, that brings us on to the company cases. One of the most difficult issues that has arisen in these cases is the situation where a company disposes of a valuable asset in circumstances where the company is owned or controlled by a debtor or relevant insolvent person. Perhaps surprisingly, this point was not considered directly until two relatively recent cases, the most recent of, most recent of which I was involved in uh, with Daniel Warrants. Although counsel in the Feekins case had relied on the fact that the agricultural tenancy had been surrendered by a company and not by Mr. Feekins, the Court of Appeal correctly treated that as being relevant to the undervalue stage, so there was no real analysis as to how this might impact on the enter into requirement. As I will come on to explain in a moment, the first case, a case called Akmadova, appeared to indicate that the debtor would always be treated as having entered into a transaction in such circumstances. Daniel and I argued with a degree of success in the more recent case, a case called Investbank and El Husseini, that the enter into requirement would not be satisfied in such circumstances. But the judge in our case left open the possibility that on appropriate facts, a relevant person might nonetheless have entered into a transaction in this scenario, even if the company itself is the beneficial owner of the asset, which is the subject matter of the alleged transaction. So just like the mortgagee cases, it may be there is no clear-cut answer in this scenario. So starting with Akmadova, this was a family division case arising from a wife's attempt to have enforce a very substantial order for payment uh, due to her by her ex-husband as a result of ancillary relief proceedings. Now, the lady in the middle of this picture is the claimant, Tatiana Akmadova, and to the left of her is our very own uh, Andrew Holden. Uh, we then have, uh, to the left of Tatiana, her ex-husband, uh, Mr. Farhad Akmadov, and according to the Times, the name of his companion, um, in, in the photograph, sorry, to the left, is Miss Anna Adamova. I understand from reports in the Daily Mail that the breakdown of the Agmedov's marriage may have been related in some way to Farhad's relationship with Miss Adamova. Also pictured here is Timo, uh, the adult son of Tatiana and Farhad. Now it seems that Farhad had a tendency to hold assets through companies, and many such assets were transferred to his son Timo. Tatiana then did what any loving mother would do in the situation. She brought claims against her son, alleging that his receipt of the various assets involved Section 43 uh, claims that had been, uh, sorry, transactions that had been entered into by Farhad. In most cases, the relevant assets were found to have been held by companies for Farhad. So, insofar as Farhad had directed his nominee companies to transfer his assets to his son, there was no difficulty in finding that Farhad had entered into a transaction at an undervalue in respect of those transfers. However, one of the impugned transfers concerned property belonging beneficially to a company called Sunningdale rather than to Farhad. The allegation was that Farhad had arranged for Sunningdale to transfer its assets to Farhad for no consideration and that Farhad had thereby entered into a transaction at an undervalue for the purposes of Section 43. Mrs Justice Gwyneth Knowles took an expansive approach to the interpretation of Section 43 on this issue. She found that the concept of a transaction was to be construed broadly and then went so far as to say 
Uh, it does not matter that the relevant transfers were made by a company owned by the judgment debtor rather than by the judgment debtor himself. That might be taken to suggest that a person who controls a company will, in all cases, be treated as having entered into transactions by which the company deals with its own property for the purposes of Section 43. Mrs Justice Knowles then went on to find that where Sunningdale had transferred its assets to the Sun, Farhad had indeed entered into a transaction. In this regard, Mrs. Justice Knowles referred to the Fekins case as authority for the proposition that a transaction can also include bringing about the sale of an asset by another person. She went on to say that this reading of Section 43 is plainly correct because otherwise the protective purpose of the statute could easily be sidestepped by a sophisticated debtor simply causing companies he owns to transfer their assets away. This, of course, goes quite beyond what was decided in Fekins because Mr. Fekins had actually been the owner of the farm, which he had caused NatWest to sell. In Akmadova, Mrs. Justice Knowles found that there could be a Section 43 transaction, even where the asset, which was the subject of the transaction, was owned by someone other than the debtor, in this case, Sunningdale, rather than Farhad. Now, this very expansive approach to the interpretation of Section 43 was heavily relied on by the claimant in the El Husseini case, which is the recent case that Daniel and I have been involved in. Now, the claimant in the El Husseini case is a bank uh, called InvestBank, and the first defendant who Daniel and I act for is a Lebanese businessman called Ahmad El Husseini. The bank claims that Ahmad is liable to it under personal guarantees said to have been given by Ahmad in respect of the liabilities of two UAE companies. The bank has obtained UAE judgments on those alleged guarantees and it brought a claim in England to enforce those judgments. In the same proceedings, the bank has also brought claims under Section 43 alleging that various assets have been transferred to members of Ahmad's family at an undervalue. Among other things, those assets include certain properties in Hyde, Gar Hyde Park Garden News, which is now on the screen. Now, the bank's Section 43 claim was not straightforward because many of the assets which had been transferred, included some, including these properties, had actually been owned uh, beneficially by various companies rather than Ahmad himself. Relying on the Akmadova case, the bank pleaded that Ahmad had entered into a Section 43 transaction in respect of company property merely on the basis that he was said to control them. In the context of a jurisdiction challenge, Daniel and I argued that these claims had no real prospect of success because as a matter of law, even if it could be proven that Ahmad had sole control of the relevant companies at the time of the asset transfers, that would not be sufficient for Ahmad to have entered into any transaction. Applying well-established company law principles, we argued that when a director of a company commits a company to a transaction, he is the company and he is not personally entering into any transaction himself in such circumstances. Now, Mr. Justice Andrew Baker largely agreed with us and found that, as pleaded, the bank's claims in respect of corporate assets did not raise a serious issue to be tried. He began by posing the question of whether a person who controls a company will, without more, be regarded as having entered into any transaction by which the company disposes of its own assets for the purposes of Section 43. After considering uh, the company law authorities, uh, Mr. Justice Andrew Baker concluded that the answer to that question was no. The reason for this is that where an individual acts as a director, he is not entering into any transaction with the company or with anyone else. He is merely the conduit by which the company itself is acting. Mr. Justice Andrew Baker called the contrary notion the self-dealing fallacy, and he found that insofar as Akmadova appeared to support that fallacy, that it was wrong. Now, because the bank had not pleaded any allegation to show that Ahmad had personally entered into any transactions involving company property, the pleaded Section 43 claims failed as a matter of law. However, Mr. Justice Andrew Baker did find that Akmadova had nonetheless been correctly decided on the facts of, of that case because Farhad, in arranging for Sunningdale to transfer assets to his son, had gone beyond simply acting as a director 
and had in fact personally entered into a transaction or arrangement with Timur. The dividing line left then between a situation where a company is acting as a director and a situation where they go beyond that, so they are considered to be acting in their personal capacity, may not be terribly easy to identify. So the question is then, where does this all leave us and what about the future? Clearly the law in this area is not yet completely settled, but on the basis of the authorities as they stand, it does seem that there may be scope to challenge transfers of corporate assets under sections 238, 339 and 43, where the company making the transfer is controlled by a debtor or someone who has become insolvent. Office holders and creditors will therefore no doubt want to scrutinize such transfers very carefully to see if the controller of the company has entered into any of the transactions. There could well be some interesting opportunities here to attack transactions that might not previously have been looked into. But the Al Husseini case demonstrates that if a claim is brought in this type of situation, it will be very important to identify precisely what the alleged transaction was and what it is said the debtor or insolvent person actually did in their personal capacity so as to have entered into the transaction. These cases also present difficult uh, or potentially difficult uh, challenges for people who control companies. Anyone who has control over a company will need to be very mindful of the fact that if the company transfers an asset, then they may be personally accused of having entered into a transaction at an undervalue. So anyone in that position who is experiencing financial difficulties should be particularly careful to ensure that everything they do in connection with the company follows all proper corporate formalities and procedures. It's a bit surprising, really, that this issue hasn't come up in cases until relatively recently, until Akhmadova was decided, even though the Insolvency Act, of course, has been in place for 35 years. But now that these recent cases have started to consider the issue, I expect there will be a lot more uh, to come uh, in the near future where these types of issues have to be considered further. Thank you very much for listening. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Emma, for that uh, talk. Um, all the more impressive for doing it uh, at short notice without her co-speaker, um, Daniel Warrants, who was uh, with her on that case, as, as she mentioned. Uh, Heather Murphy will be talking about how the traditional chancery uh, remedy of an account uh, can be used in commercial cases and was used in a case she was involved in uh, to great effect. Thank you, Stephen. So, yes, this is my attempt to smuggle the very dry chancery topic of accounts into a commercial conference, which uh, posed the question, can a claimant improve their position by seeking an account? Now, the short answer, which would allow Ms. Bayliss to take the podium, that she is quite keen to get to, is yes, and then it would be over. It's not a very informative answer. Um, I'm going to be talking about times travel and PIA. And for those of you who were paying attention last year, you might think, hmm, Heather talked about this last year, so it's a bit of a rerun. I did talk about times travel and PIA last year, but that was limb one, where we went up to the Supreme Court on lawful act economic dress, and where we sadly lost. This talk is about limb two, which is a far more interesting talk um, for two reasons. Firstly, because we actually managed to recover some five million pounds for the client, so the client was very happy. Um, and secondly, because at both first instance and on appeal, where I appeared, uh, we won. So it's a much happier story than limb one. So, the claim for times travel at its core was simply that two travel agents said they had not been paid the commission that was due to them from their airline, and that commission arose when they sold tickets to fly on PIA. Now, if you wish to fly on PIA, I was advised by my clients not to, quite a lot of cockroaches on it, and you would now struggle to because their safety record is so bad they have been banned from flying within Europe. In 2017, it's because they faked pilot's licenses, it's quite alarming. Um, in 2017, the court accepted after a trial that commission hadn't been paid and ordered an account to determine how much was owed to the agents. And there are a number of reported judgments that arose from this, but the three in particular that I'm going to touch on are on the screen, all unhelpfully named Time Travel and PIA. So the first point was that we were an agent, and this was therefore an account against a principal. Now if you look at Bostead and Reynolds, very learned on agency, 
You'll see a lot on the ability for an agent to seek an account against a principal. It's very much the agent's duty. But in the technical sense, Diddley Squat squared on the idea that an agent might be able to use an account to seek um, commission due from the principal. And beyond a handful of cases referenced in a very exciting book published in 1911 called The Law of Accounts, um, which detail occasions where this remedy was used in the Victorian period, I'm not aware of any reported cases of agents using this tool to get the commission that is due to them out of, um, their agent, out of their principles in the last 150 years. So, in short, what is an account in this circumstance? It's not the sort of account that arrives in a trust sense. There's no underlying fiduciary relationship. We're not in the sort of equitable account that you'll find detailed in Snell. We're much more, um, I think it's fair to say, as Stephen described it, in the sort of commercial court world of accounts of trying to work out sums due via a spreadsheet. Um, although it might not be the sort of traditional chancery account, that doesn't prevent um, the court from treating it actually in much the same way once you've got one established. And the situations in which you might be able to obtain an account, as well as the traditional chancery, you're holding or using another per person's property, or profits have been obtained when they ought not to, is in order to enforce contractual rights. So this was the sort of, we were using the account in order to enforce our contractual rights. The reason that we needed to use the account was um, because of the way that commission was calculated by PIA. So historically, it was very straightforward. You sold a ticket for £100, PIA paid commission of £9. The agent knew everything they needed to know about what commission was due and therefore hadn't been paid. In 2012, largely because PIA didn't like paying the £9, um, PIA changed their rate of commission. What they now offered was that agents had an opportunity where a ticket for the public was worth £100 to acquire it for 93 And that would allow the agent to sell to the public at 93 and offer something quite different because why would you go to a physical travel agency when you could just buy online? Well, a good reason might well be because the agent will sell the ticket cheaper or £99 or £100. And if you like, the profit that was made on that ticket would be the benefit the agent would get. Now, if you were contracting with a more transparent airline as an agent and you went onto the booking system, you would see the public ticket price, let's say Emirates, flight to Dubai, very cheap, £300, and the uh, public price, £350. Comparison there, clear. So when you saw the ticket, you immediately knew and had recorded what benefit you had obtained. PIA were less uh, clear and transparent. In fact, it's fair to say they were pretty opaque because whenever you went on the booking website for the agents for PIA, all you saw was the agent's price at 93 pounds. And insofar as my clients could ascertain by looking online to see what they could buy through PIA's website, it looked like the PIA were selling the same ticket to the public at 93 pounds. So, in this situation, PIA were the people who held the relevant knowledge about what commission was going to be due. They held the public ticket price. It wasn't disclosed to my clients. And therefore, we fell into the situation, uh, as I said on the previous slide, where the relevant facts are within the knowledge of the defendant or the accounting party. By comparison, if we'd wanted to claim commission from Emirates, we wouldn't have been able to obtain an account because there we had both the public and the agent's price. But because PIA weren't telling us that information, we weren't able to actually calculate ourselves what commission might be due. So, what was the benefit that we obtained over a contract, over a claim for breach of contract? Very quickly, there were four. Sequential reveal. Um, because this was an account, PIA had to put their cards on the table first. Now, they were, as you might imagine, pretty reluctant to engage with the proceedings um, and pretty reluctant to give us any information. And the account at least allowed us to force them to actually have to show their hand first, which is pretty attractive because it allowed us 
then to take lots of pot shots at what they had done. Secondly, the burden of proof. The accounting party, even in this case, which was a contractual account, bared the evidential burden. So having provided their spreadsheet, it was up to PIA to satisfy the court that the agents had received the remuneration. Now that was advantageous because we were the claimant. If we had just sued for damages, the burden would have been on us. Um, but this is, if you like, the real strength of an account, is having established that we were entitled to one, the court was very happy to switch the burden of proof on to PIA. And again, this was another tactical advantage because it, it encouraged them to engage a little bit more. Uh, what PIA did, insofar as they could engage, was they produced a spreadsheet with the relevant comparators, um, but most of the data was missing. It did, out of 100,000 line entries, show examples where the ticket price that the agents had received was less than the public price. It was about 150 examples of those, so pretty small. Uh, the court was quite content to hold that there was no evidence that remuneration had been given at all. Um, and it also accepted that PIA had not met their evidential burden. The burden of proof was on them to satisfy the court that they had given remuneration and they had failed to discharge that burden. So to this point, why is an account something that's quite useful to seek? Well, because it meant we couldn't exactly sit back, but it was the defendant who had to do a lot of the running and they were the ones who had to actually show that remuneration had been given. Why is the third benefit? Well, PIA, let's say, didn't enjoy engaging with lots of the litigation, and so we got them debarred. As I said, they produced a spreadsheet which missed most of the data, and we applied for and obtained an unless order. Now, as a sort of general note, the case that's on the screen is quite useful for a sort of what's the general effect of a debarring order. It's been approved by the Court of Appeal, but um, Edwin Johnson, as he then was, sitting as a deputy, was quite clear. It basically means, it says well, on the tin, you can't participate. But he goes, went on to say this doesn't mean that the claimant simply wins by default. They've got to actually establish they're entitled to their relief. And the consequences, in the situation where you're in an account situation, where the burden is on the defendant to participate and to, and to satisfy an evidential burden, debarring them from defending has much more severe ramifications than in a straightforward case where the defendant doesn't have any burden. Because suddenly, it's the defendant's ob obligation to satisfy the court and they can't participate. You as the claimant get to sit back and take nice pot shots at the evidence they have produced without them able to defend it. And so to this extent, because the account shifted all of the weight onto PIA to actually engage, the debarring order had a pretty substantial effect um, and we were able to spend two days trouncing their account and getting completely the figure that we said ought to go in, um, which I don't think would have worked if it had been the other way around because as a claimant we'd have had to establish our case whether or not the defendant was participating. And the final point, which is a bit more, I raise as a sort of uh, a possibility is whether the account gave us a judgment award that was more appeal proof. So PIA tried to at appeal attacking our evidence but the underlying problem was because the account had placed all of the weight on PIA to do the running our evidence was only ever responsive and so whenever we were saying no actually the court should be quite content with our evidence uh, the calculations had been done on what PIA had filed. Their complaint that our evidence might be weak involved them necessarily attacking their own evidence. And fundamentally, they conceded that they would have to necessitate a new hearing and a new evidence. And so they lost the appeal. If we had simply gone for a claim for damages, our evidence would have had to stand alone and could have come under greater scrutiny from the court. So finally, should you use an account? Um, I mean, for my clients, it was very successful because although it took us five years, well, four years between um, getting the order for the account and actually getting the judgment, we did manage to obtain on the account over five million pounds. It was available 
as an agent for a claim against a principal for commission, which is useful because we didn't have any of the underlying information to allow us to make those calculations. Um, and it had the great tactical advantage of placing the burden of proof on the accounting party. And that was even the case when, if you like, it was a contractual re uh, obligation that was being enforced rather than a sort of fiduciary one. The court was still very content that all of the rules about accounts, the obligations and the evidential burdens that might apply in chancery cases, arose here. And so for that reason, I would commend to you the uh, otherwise archaic and chancery remedy of taking an account. Thank you very much. Well, um, what better illustration could you have of an ancient chancery remedy being applied to a modern situation than using the remedy of an account and a uh, claim for commission for a travel agent selling airline tickets? Um, well, that's not a rhetorical question. One of the answers might be how you use civil fraud tools um, to apply them to crypto assets and NFTs. So I'm going to invite Ben and Sarah to um, explain how uh, in concepts of property jurisdiction injunctions are being applied to the new world of crypto assets and NFTs. Welcome to the arcane world of crypto assets. Uh, on the screen, uh, you see two of the Boss Babes series of NF NFTs, recently stolen from artist Lavinia Osborne's crypto wallet on OpenSea. Uh, we'll hear a bit more about them later on. Uh, you also see, uh, you also see uh, number 2162 of the Bored Apes Yacht Club uh, series, BAYC, as those in the know. Uh, like to shorten it to. Uh, that's on Ethereum. Uh, and uh, 2162 was uh, also nicked recently from a Singaporean NFT investor. Now, unless the desirability of NFTs has up until now uh, passed you by, uh, please uh, listen to the plaintive cry uh, of the owner of 2162, or, or perhaps the code associated with 2162. We'll hear a bit more about that later as well. Uh, as he poignantly remarked uh, in fluent press release, there are only 10,000 apes in the world owned by personalities such as Madonna, Justin Bieber, Eminem, Jimmy Fallon and Paris Hilton. On the 29th of April 22, the floor price for BAYC hit an all-time high of 152 Ethereum, or 434,000 USD, on OpenSea. Uh, BAYC uh, number 2162, which is the only one in the world, is rare because it is the only one wearing a beanie who has a jovial expression, um, as well as the fact that he is a virgin ape and hasn't been fed with mutant serum. So there you are. Um, here are a couple of his friends. Uh, I think they probably have been on the mutant serum, but I'm, uh, I'm not an expert. So the... the um, slightly legal question uh, we pose uh, in the title of this program uh, in, the, um, in the menu is how well does the civil fraud asset litigation toolbox perform uh, in crypto asset fraud cases? Um, well, in terms of causes of action uh, that you might be um, looking at, they're, they're up on the screen, um, uh, in the case of those, uh, those causes of action, the remedies and in the case of tracing processes, much of the effectiveness of the toolkit, certainly as it relates to claims with proprietary asset, uh, assets, uh, is going to uh, come down to the law's approach uh, to the thinginess of things. Um, and that's what we're going to concentrate on in this talk. Um, we're not going to talk about smart contracts because for the most part, I think how much use those are to lawyers is a question of what they say rather than how they work. Um, and we're not going to say so much about the elements of the toolkit surrounding deceit, conspiracy and unjust enrichment, where the thinginess of things uh, may be less of an issue. Uh, what we're going to concentrate on is the nature of crypto assets, and we're going to look briefly at the, at the impact that has on uh, claims a little bit on jurisdiction uh, and the availability um, of interlocutory relief. Uh, let's start with some definitions. These are randomly taken uh, from uh, uh, Investopedia. Cryptocurrency, 
um, is a decentralized network based on blockchain technology, it boldly says. Well, that doesn't much sound like property uh, for our purposes, particularly when you consider that the definition of a blockchain is that it is a database or ledger which records transactions or ownership. Um, that's not got the ring of thinginess for, for, to my mind. Um, NFTs look more promising because they're described as cryptographic assets. Uh, that sounds much more like property. But what you quickly learn when you start looking into this stuff is that the way techie types who write um, these sorts of descriptions use language bears no relation uh, whatever uh, to the legal meanings of the words used. And this is a world where the distinction between a database recording transactions and the assets subject to the transactions isn't a particularly relevant consideration, uh, and so these sorts of words uh, are used interchangeably. As a matter of fact, insofar as I've understood it, which may not be very far, the way a Bitcoin is recorded uh, and exists on a blockchain, uh, and the way an NFT uh, does too, uh, are broadly similar. The only real distinction is that an NFT uh, is uh, unique uh, in certain ways that Bitcoins um, uh, are not. Uh, so, Ben is going to explain to us what, uh, whether they're property and what sort of property they are. I'd better give you the clicker. Are we going up or right? Right. Thank you. Um, yes, so crypto assets, uh, decentralized digital things made of computer code, uh, ones and zeros, uh, or as my cabbie put it this morning, they don't exist really, do they? Um, a recent case referred to this idea by calling crypto assets simply a stream of electrons. Well, people may remember that that was the phrase used to describe the issue of tracing banking payments, which don't actually involve the exchange of any assets or value. They involve the creation, deletion of credits and debits on a bank account. Well, the commercial court and the common law managed to solve that problem, and they're going to solve this one as well. As everything, as ever, everything is new and difficult, but the commercial law will make it work. Today, we're reconciling the world of the basement-dwelling hacker with the world of the horsehair wig. So, are crypto assets property? The common law takes a very broad approach to property. I put the definition from the Insolvency Act on the slide, and this is about as broad as you can possibly imagine. It includes money, it includes obligations, and it includes um, interests that are only incidental to property, thus including the word of the definition in the definition, which may or may not be helpful. Um, the foundational point, however, on what is property comes from the statement of Lord Wilberforce um, in the National Provincial Bank and Ainsworth case. And this holds that property essentially has four characteristics. Um, it needs to be definable. It needs to be identifiable by third parties. It needs to be capable of being assumed by third parties or transferable. Um, and it needs to have some form of permanence and stability. So those are things you're looking for for property. Well, that makes sense and that works with what we think of as property. The difficulty is when it comes to personal property, it's long been considered that there are only two types and you have to bring yourself within one of those categories. Uh, things in possession, such as goods, or things in action, things you can bring actions to enforce. For example, that bank account credit which you can sue the bank to get back. That's problematic because crypto assets can't be physically possessed and their decentralized nature means that describing them as things in action where you can sue to get what you want is a little bit awkward. So can they be property? How can we describe them as property? Now that distinction between things in possession and things in action was accepted wisdom, but it never really made sense. If one looks at the picture of my uncle Jeff and his friend Daisy, this refers to a case in which milk quotas were found to be property. Now, they weren't things in possession, and they weren't things in action really either, but they were property. Similarly, with carbon emission uh, quotas, the same thing applied there. They weren't things in possession, they didn't really fit into things in action. But we'd all just sort of carried on thinking that personal property still fell into these two categories. Recently, the, tar the UK Jurisdiction Task Force has looked at this in relation to cryptocurrencies and smart contracts. I say recently 2019, but that's, that's recently sometimes at the bar. 
Um, this task force is led by Sir Geoffrey Voss, and the idea was to get the commercial law ready for this, uh, these new technologies and to, to, to fit around them. What that task force did is they looked at these two examples and they said personal property being divided into these two categories doesn't really work. Um, if you look at crypto assets, they're used in business. People think they are property. They deal with them as if they're property. They probably should be property. So that can't be the test. And they went back to National Provincial Bank in Ainsworth and they said that's what property is. If you can fit it within those four criteria, it's property. They dismissed the idea that crypto assets were simply information or mere rights. Since crypto assets fit those four criteria of Ainsworth, they form a kind of property. Now, if you take a step back, that had to be the answer. Um, businesses use these. People rely on their value. People trade them. Everyone thinks they're property. If the law had suddenly decided they weren't property because of some arcane principles, the commercial world would have been upset. So they had to be made property. They look like it, they smell like it, they are property. Fortunately, the courts acting in a judicial capacity, rather than just writing reports, agreed. Um, AA and Persons Unknown is the leading case on this point at the moment, um, and it adopted the conclusions from the task force statement. This was an interesting case about the increasing uh, circumstance of a ransomware attack where a company's systems are frozen by hackers who uh, encrypt all of their uh, documents and they tell them that they can only have them back if they pay a ransom, usually in cryptocurrency. As you can see from the, sli uh, the quotes on the slide, uh, this particular hacker uh, was very polite and very, uh, a very com astute commercial operator who, over a series of interactions, negotiated a good price with a discount, presumably for a first-time buyer. The company got the money from its insurance company to pay off the hacker, and the hacker did decrypt their files. Uh, the insurance company then wanted to get its money back, so brought claims to pursue the Bitcoin that had been paid over. These included seeking a constructive trust over the cryptocurrency on the basis that a thief holds the fruits of their theft on constructive trust. So they wanted a constructive trust, and they wanted a proprietary injunction to protect that pending trial. That meant they need to show that Bitcoin was property. Brian Jay essentially adopted the reasoning uh, from the statement of the task force and said that the idea there were only two types of personal property was fallacious. And there was a third category into which milk quotas and carbon emissions and crypto assets might fall if you need to categorize them. Again, really, he didn't have a choice. This was a fraud case coming before the commercial court if he decided that Bitcoin wasn't property, then he couldn't have considered a constructive trust, he couldn't have granted a proprietary injunction, and the commercial court would have been hamstrung in respond, responding to fraud. This has been followed in lots of other interlocutory decisions recently, almost always against persons unknown because of the nature of these cases. However, in Wang and Derby, there was an inter-parties hearing where, where both, both parties were represented, and it was agreed that crypto assets uh, were property. Um, in Osborne, this has been extended to NFTs, whereas the previous cases have mostly been cryptocurrencies. So it, it now appears, at least at an interlocutory level, that crypto assets are property. Uh, uh, Sir Geoffrey Voss certainly thinks this. I've, I've put a quote, some quotes from his uh, recent speech launching the next stage of the task force reporting, of this on the smart contracts, on, on the slide. And it's useful to work out where the, the, the courts are coming from. Um, Voss points out the blockchain and crypto assets are here. Um, he says you should think of them the way that the internet was in the 1990s. Um, people who are saying, oh, it, it's going to pass, or it's not important, I don't need to know about it, are wrong. Um, the commercial parties are using this, and therefore we need to be able to make it work with our existing principles or to adapt our principles if it doesn't work. Um, the cases are complicated because the principles were set up in, a, in another era with different sorts of property and different sorts of transactions, but they need to make, be made to fit this beneficial form of commercial activity. So that's all sorted. We've, we've got it. It's property. Isn't that right, Sarah? Mm, well, maybe. Let's see. Um, let's suppose for a moment, give Mr. Wasteful the benefit of the doubt, um, and assume, thank you very much, um, for a moment that uh, uh, crypto assets, whether they're um, Bitcoin or, or NFT, 
are in fact property. Um, there's, uh, and that's clearly the direction of travel. Um, but what sort of property are they? Um, Geoffrey Voss uh, has uh, made some useful statements, but they're quite general. Uh, and in the case of NFTs in particular, um, what you're buying um, uh, very often mutates over time for various reasons. One of the uh, criteria uh, that uh, enables um, uh, things to be defined as property is that they need to be identifiable. Um, the Jurisdiction Task Force was careful to point out in the original report that whether or not a court will treat any particular crypto asset as property is dependent on the nature of the asset, the rules of the system in which it exists, and the purpose for which the question is asked. Um, the same questions uh, still need to be asked in order to identify what proprietary rights might arise uh, in relation to a particular asset. Now, the boats probably sailed to a greater or lesser extent so far as cryptocurrencies are concerned um, because, uh, you know, one bit of Bitcoin is the same as any other bit of Bitcoin. Um, it, it, the only thing that changes about it uh, quite dramatically appears to be its value. Um, but this is Human One by Beeple. Uh, Beeple, uh, otherwise known as Mike Winkleman, uh, his main claim to fame, as some of you may know, uh, is selling his NFT 5,000 days uh, at Christie's uh, last year for getting on for $70 million. Um, Christie's website, interestingly, describes 500 days as a work of art and the NFT associated with it. Uh, so uh, the two things are identified separately. Um, the NFT is a bit of code. Uh, the piece of art is uh, a file with a digital artwork in it. Now, Christie's catalogue describes Human One as a generative work of art, a dynamically changing hybrid physical and digital piece which the artist intends to seamlessly add and evolve creatively over the course of his lifetime. So the piece of property you buy is not the piece of property you end up with, um, or indeed the piece of property you have from day to day subsequently bit like the picture of Dorian Gray, a comparison which I'm sure is not lost uh, on Mr. Winkleman. Um, this is the merge. Um, and in terms of identifiable property, I think the merge is particularly interesting. The merge is a series of NFTs which raised $92 million uh, from around 29,000 collectors who purchased what were described as 312, 686 units of mass, which, each of which was a single NFT. The NFTs consist of these white uh, masses or dots against a black background. The more mass a buyer accumulates, the larger their dots become. Uh, but the NFT has a built-in scarcity mechanism, which ensures that the token supply decreases over time. Uh, because every merged token that is transferred um, into your wallet merges with the merge tokens you already have. So that you have a higher mass token, you don't lose out financially, but you only have a single token. So uh, in this way, a mechanism which forms part of, or at least is associated with your NFT, automatically modifies the nature of the property you own. Uh, and eventually, in theory at least, there will be one blob left, and one person will have the entire value of the blob. Uh, there are also interesting, I think, moves afoot uh, to enable artists to self-publish NFTs via open source software. Um, now, uh, one uh, entity uh, which has produced some software, um, eponymous software, is Cell. Now, Cell says the minting of the NFTs onto the blockchain uh, by, via the open source technology remains fundamentally the same, but it seems conceivable to me that if future developments distance or dis disassociate NFTs from particular pieces of code on the blockchain that represent the token, uh, then that might affect their status as, uh, as property. Um, be that as it may, uh, one important part of your uh, toolkit uh, is going to be um, jurisdiction and service out, because you're going to want ultimately to get, get at the unknown 
the unknown people um, who've nicked your crypt uh, uh, crypto assets. Um, I'm going to deal with this very lightly indeed because uh, we think the property stuff is a bit, bit more interesting. You're going to, there, there'll be the usual um, suspects when it comes to the gateways um, in uh, CPD, um, CPR6, uh, practice direction um, uh, B at 3.1. You've got contract at six, taught at, uh, taught at nine for your deceit and conversion cases. Property in the jurisdiction is 11 and 15 of particular note uh, in these cases is where there's a constructive trust. Now this came up in the uh, Boss Babes case, um, uh, which, uh, in, in which um, His Honour Justice Pelling QC uh, said that um, the way to look at crypto assets was to treat them as being in the um, jurisdiction of the owner. So wherever your wallet is as a matter of computing, um, it, it, your crypto assets, some, some kind of computer game bolt on are floating around with you uh, wherever you are. Uh, and he therefore used Gateway 15, uh, which is the one that goes, the claimant may serve a form out of the jurisdiction with the permission of the court, where a claim is made against the defendant as a constructive trustee, you've nicked stuff, you're a constructive trustee, um, where the claim arises out of acts committed or events occurring uh, within this jurisdiction or, or relates to assets within this jurisdiction. Uh, and there's a couple of cases on the screen which uh, consider jurisdiction and service out in crypto assets cases. Um, so, Ben, injunctive relief, back, back to you. Right, so th this is what we're, we're all here for um, in, the, in the civil fraud scenario. Uh, we either want to get our hands on the loot um, or we want to avoid the other side getting their hands on the loot. Um, loot, interestingly, is a maker of NFTs. Um, I'm not sure if the irony was lost on them when they sell lines of computer code for many millions of dollars, uh, but that's what they called themselves. Uh, so I thought that was an interesting slide. Um, the common law, especially the commercial court, fam are famously generous in helping victims of fraud investigate, pursue, and recover the fruits of a fraud from the fraudsters. So, with these new assets, which are going to be important, how does our toolkit stand up? So this is our basic toolkit um, with which we can ask a judge to whack the other side um, or seek to avoid being whacked, depending on the position. Most cases are going to start with a freezer to protect our ability to recover after we've proved our case um, or to uh, inflict pain and pressure on the other side while they're trying to weather our attack and vice versa. Um, if we want more protection, we can seek a proprietary injunction where we can say, that's mine, don't touch it. Um, this will increase the protection for the thing we want and it will increase the pain on the other side who can't even touch that thing to fund the litigation. Once the court accepted as I think it probably has, although I take Sarah's criticisms, that crypto assets are property, it's been very happy to grant these injunctions, at least at least an interlocutory stage, um, in the same way it as it would for any other, any other property. And there are now a large number of cases granting those injunctions. Um, in other civil fraud cases, particularly tracing claims, we're going to want to look at Norwich Pharmacal Relief or Bankers Trust's orders to try and identify the wrongdoers or, or the loot. These have been especially crucial in crypto fraud cases where frequently the defenders are unknown hackers and we need to try and identify where they've gone and where they've put the loot. Now this is quite an important area for crypto asset fraud. Um, often you're not going to know where the unknown hacker is and the likelihood is they're probably going to be out of the jurisdiction. That causes a problem because there's been a long standing, well, relatively long standing authority that you can't serve Norwich Pharmacal um, applications or orders on uh, defendants outside the jurisdiction. You can't get that relief. And that was AB Bank and Abu Dhabi Commercial Bank. That's a big problem for crypto um, fraud cases. And in the AA and Persons Unknown case, which decided that crypto assets uh, were property and they could be a proprietary injunction, the banker's trust order sought wasn't made in that case because of this concern about whether they could be made against respondents outside the jurisdiction. What happened in that case instead was there was an ancillary order that the defendants, as well as being subject to the injunction, had to disclose who the wrongdoer was. Uh, but it wasn't a, wasn't a banker's trust order or a, or a Norwich pharmacal order. 
since then, there's been some cases changing this position. Um, Ion Science uh, distinguished the previous case and said on the, an interlocutory basis that's, that's all that's needed to be done, and so will grant bankers' trusts orders. Um, they relied upon the fact that that's different to Norwich Pharma Course, it didn't strictly fall within the authority, um, that previous authority had suggested these sorts of orders could be sought against foreign defendants in a case of hot pursuit, such as fraud, um, and then in Iron Science, they also referred on, on the potential situs of property being with the domicile of the owner. Um, Fetch AI has continued that approach. So it seems that you can get bankers' trusts orders, but at the moment you probably can't get a Norwich Pharmacal order um, because the existing authority needs to be challenged on that. I've also put alternative service down there because we all need to remember that we need to get the defendant and in these sorts of cases we probably aren't going to know their usual residence. Um, so emailing an email that you can find connected to a relevant domain is probably going to um, count and a hot pursuit is a normal exception to the, the usual requirement to serve under the Hague Convention and other conventions. So, the toolkit is working and it's available in relation to these assets as it is for anything else. There are some specific issues though to consider when what's in question is a crypto asset. Um, we've talked about property quite a lot, uh, that's the obvious one. Next, volatility. Uh, it's famous that Bitcoin is extremely volatile. That also goes for um, all sorts of other sorts of crypto assets, particularly NFTs. Um, famously, some NFTs launched a while ago which sold out for millions and millions of dollars and then became almost worthless when people realized they didn't get much for it. Um, in Tomer and Murray, uh, an injunction was declined on various bases, but the court did find that damages wouldn't have been an adequate remedy for the respondent defendants uh, because of the volatility of Bitcoin. So the, the injunction was going to freeze their Bitcoin so they couldn't touch it. And the judge found that that would expose them to enormous losses if they couldn't intervene to uh, mitigate the rising and falling of uh, Bitcoin's value. Um, and that's also been replicated in Tulip in relation to security for costs, saying that Bitcoin simply, uh, cryptocurrencies are simply too volatile to rely upon in those, those circumstances. The final thing I'm going to talk about uh, before handing back to Sarah is um, asset disclosure and policing these orders. So it's no good getting an order if it's just a piece of paper and you can't do anything with it. Um, if you've frozen someone's house, you can look at the land registry and see if anything's going on with it. And that might not be a perfect way of policing it, but it is an option. In relation to crypto assets, you also need to think about policing it. Um, in the uh, Wang and Derby case, uh, the, uh, the defendants sought to vary a proprietary injunction saying that they didn't have sufficient assets available to fund the litigation and so were trying to mislead the court essentially about the assets they had. This involved um, saying that they'd lost the password to the hard drive which gave them access to their cryptocurrency and said it may still be accessible but I can't access it, I don't have it. This would have been potentially a difficult argument to get past at an interlocutory stage. Uh, however, the claimant and applicant had instructed a cryptocurrency expert who was able to look at the blockchain and work out that that wallet had in fact been used. So he hadn't lost his password, he was lying to the court, and he got a proprietary injunction against him and uh, almost a finding of dishonesty on an interlocutory basis. So to conclude on this part, the toolkit works, but it will need maintaining and updating. And in these cases, it may well be wise to always have a technical expert standing by. Well... Much, uh, much has been done, as Ben has explained, but there is much to do. Um, oh, you already did it for me. Uh, hold the front page. When uh, Osborne, um, uh, it, uh, shortly after the ex parte hearing in Osborne, um, the people involved very wisely um, sent out a press release and got lots of coverage. Um, uh, and um, most of it to this or equivalent effect. NFT is recognised as legal property in landmark case. Victims of NFTs uh, are now likely to have greater protection in the UK, although other jurisdictions are lagging behind. It is uh, of the utmost significance. As for the first time in the world, as far as we're aware, a court of law has recognised that an NFT is, cap is property capable of being frozen by way of an injunction. Uh, this ruling therefore removes any uncertainty uh, did you write this? 
uh, any uncertainty that NFTs as tokens consisting of code are property in and of themselves distinct from the thing they represent, e.g. a digital artwork, under the law of England and Wales. Let's see what His Honour Judge Pellin QC actually said. He said, I am satisfied on the basis of the evidence available that the claimant has demonstrated a good arguable case that she's been defrauded of the non-fungible tokens to which she refers in her evidence. There is clearly going to be an issue at some stage as to whether non-fungible tokens constitute property uh, for the purposes of the law in England and Wales. But I'm satisfied uh, on the basis of the submissions made on behalf of the claimant claimant that there is at least a realistically arguable case that such tokens are to be treated as property as a matter of English law. And you will not find a case where it's put, certainly uh, in relation to NFTs, you will not find a case where it's put more highly than that. Um, so direction of travel, tick, final conclusion, still waiting. Um, we vigorously agree. Thank you very much for listening. Uh, thank you very much to Sarah Bayliss and Ben Wastel for their uh, discussion of how the common law is um, edging or maybe marching into the future. Um, we're going to continue with one more talk before the coffee break. Um, if uh, you have the misfortune to have to prove a law not as uh, enlightened as the English common law in your case, uh, Alina and Ben are going to explain how that might be done. Um, there have been recent topics, uh, recent discussions. Uh, sorry, uh, it's Tom and Alina, isn't it? Uh, Ben's just finished. Um, so Tom and Alina are going to talk about um, foreign law and uh, how it needs to be pleaded and proven. There has been um, debate over the years. Uh, there's always uncertainty in interlocutory uh, cases about uh, the extent to which you need to produce expert evidence, the extent to which you can rely on presumptions when you have issues of foreign law within your cases. So, uh, Alina and uh, Tom, not Ben. I'm going to launch straight in. Um, this is the principle we're looking at today. Foreign law is a matter of fact, therefore it must be pleaded and proved. I have a quick look at how the current position is justified uh, in the case law, try and decipher it a little bit, and also whether the criticisms of it are warranted. This will necessarily be brief because otherwise we won't get to Tom's much more practical discussion of how we go about proving foreign law and to what extent the available options are now on the increase and offer greater flexibility. So, Dicey tells us that the principle that in an English court, foreign law is a matter of fact has long been well established. Well, I don't suppose anyone can sensibly disagree with that. But whether the well-established position is justified is perhaps more open to debate. And certainly, Professor Briggs, in his lecture that I mentioned there, um, for his part, has criticised the principle, saying there's simply no need to say that foreign law is, in fa is a fact in an English court. That just makes us look silly, because it isn't. It's law. A judge may not know it, but that does not make it fact. Isn't that obvious? Well, yes, to a degree. <laughs> Of course, foreign law is law. So there is, at least at first blush, a lot to recommend that position, not least the fact that we will stop looking silly in Professor Briggs's eyes. Uh, but upon further inspection, it perhaps suffers from the same problem in that it um, is oversimplistic and doesn't explain each case. So let's just think back effectively to our studies of uh, law and think about the difference of what is a question of fact and what is a question of law. A question of fact is one which must be answered by reference to facts and evidence and inferences arising from those facts. That is done by the tribunal of fact. Now, obviously, the cases that we're concerned with, that's the same person, that is the judge. But there are situations in which the tribunal of fact is different. A question of law is one which must be answered by applying relevant legal principles, by an interpretation of law. That's to be done by the judge in any case. So if we conclude that the content of foreign law is a question of law, that means we're asking the English court to determine not just what the content of foreign law is by reference to a weighing 
of the expert evidence that it has in front of it, but to use its own knowledge to apply or interpret the foreign law. Now, that might be perfectly permissible, uh, something the courts engage in generally, where the law is similar to that in England or where um, the principles are familiar to the English court. That is the distinction that is drawn in Macmillan Bishopsgate by Lord Justice Evans in the 1998 decision, and it's been approved subsequently, including uh, recently in the case of buyers that I'll touch upon again briefly later. Um, basically, that where there are relevant foreign law, uh, where the relevant foreign law that the court is considering is based on concepts similar to those in English law, Judges are entitled to and indeed bound to bring their knowledge of the common law and of the rules of statutory construction into account. And there is legal input from the judge in addition to the judicial task of assessing the weight of the evidence given. That cannot be said to be the case in relation to other types of foreign law with concepts entirely unfamiliar to an English judge. And uh, it doesn't appear to be that uh, Professor Briggs even suggests otherwise. In fact, he says that a judge simply looking at some materials of, of law, and he gives the example of Zambian law, and then bringing his own legal input to bear is wrong in every conceivable way. So that shows that it's not as simple as simply saying it's a matter of law or it's a matter of fact. So far, the courts have simply referred to it as a question of fact of a peculiar kind. Um, that's, that's some, some characterization, I guess. Um, but ultimately, the debate becomes somewhat arid because, in practice, how a matter of foreign law is approached will depend in large part on how similar it is to English law. I'm just going to touch very quickly on some key rules uh, that we talk about when we consider what we need to do in cases where issues of foreign law arise and just to make sure that we're all on the same page. So we've got Dicey's Rule 25. I'm sure um, lots of you are very familiar with it. Um, I, I won't read it out. Um, you all have it there. Confusingly, um, that rule misses out an important and logically prior option um, and also uh, there's, in some cases, there's a talk of the default rule and a presumption separate for some reason from the rule in 25.2, even though, as I will go on to explain, uh, rule 25.2, subsection 2, that we've just looked at, is um, the presumption of similarity that we talk about. Unhelpfully, in uh, the Iranian offshore case, which I'll touch on, uh, the, de uh, the uh, presumption of similarity or 25.2 is also referred to as the default rule. So I'm just going to adopt uh, the position that Lord Leggett took in uh, Brownlee number two. So that position is the default rule. It is a rule of English civil procedure that English law is applicable in its own right where foreign law is not pleaded. That makes sense. It's not concerned with establishing the content of foreign law at all. The reason provided for this makes a lot of sense, at least to me. It is that in an adversarial system, such as that in England and Wales, if a party does not rely on a particular rule, even though it would be entitled to do so, it is not generally for the court to apply of its own motion. The issues in the proceedings are defined by the parties in their statements of case, and it's for each party to choose whether to plead a case um, as to foreign law or not. Um, that principle describes what happened in the case of Ramalpa, which you see on the slide there. Here, it was a dispute arising from a contract which contained an express governing law clause in favour of Dutch law, but nonetheless was decided entirely according to English domestic law because neither party invoked Dutch law. So far, so good. Then there's a presumption of similarity. Now, if I, <laughs> if I, I could spend uh, basically the next half an hour, maybe an hour talking about the presumption of similarity and, and Tom will touch on it also because it's incredibly complex. But let's try and make it as simple as possible. It's a rule of evidence that foreign law should be taken to reflect the English law position. So it is concerned with what the content of foreign law should be taken to be. We just say that it reflects that in English law. 
so Iranian offshore I've given as an example, but it's conceptually a bit inter uh, interesting because when I, I was trying to get this straight in my mind, it's, it's sort of, I imagined it on a spectrum. So at one hand we have the default rule, at the other hand uh, we have, well, I suppose, everyone actually proving um, foreign law by reference to evidence and then presumption of similarity in the middle. And Iranian offshore falls somewhere between uh, the default rule and the presumption of similarity. And that's because the claimant there pleaded the claim without uh, mentioning any foreign law. Then two of the defendants who actually engaged pleaded that the applicable law was Iranian law, but then proceeded to not plead uh, not plead any consequences of that um, or any um, case as to what the content of Iranian law was and everyone sort of proceeded um, on the basis that no one was putting forward any evidence um, no um, no party sought uh, permission to rely on expert evidence but obviously this all came to bear at the pre-trial review where the claimant said well I've always said um, I don't have a problem with admitting that Iranian law applies, but I'm relying on the presumption, Rule 25.2, or presumption of similarity. Um, whereas the defendant said, well, no, actually, we'd like to plead um, that the presumption doesn't apply, but they haven't provided any content of foreign law that they would be asking uh, the court to apply. So Mr. J Justice Andrew Baker there appears to uh, conclude as a matter of proper case management, as he puts it, to rule out the disapplication of the presumption. He did leave open, though did not encourage, the possibility of an application by the defendants to change the status quo by amending their pleadings, seeking permission to expert, um, for expert evidence, etc., although it was not likely to succeed at the late stage um, that they'd got to. I can see the good sense of the presumption there as a case management tool, okay? It, it's a fudge, yes. Uh, but it allows the court to adjudicate where one party clearly intended to litigate on the basis of the default rule and the other failed to displace it and conveyed that it too was actually not concerned with establishing the content of Iranian law. Where I run into some difficulty, and perhaps one of you um, afterwards at drinks can, can enlighten me, uh, but to justify the presumption as a tool to assist parties where their proof of foreign law has fallen short for whatever reason. That is the situation in Brownlee number two, where the claimant, albeit the pleading was somewhat scant, uh, had, had produced expert evidence, but there were gaps. Following the decision in that case, it's clearly open for a party to seek to rely on the presumption in those circumstances. But I would posit that in such cases, it would be more appropriate for parties to appeal to the flexibility encouraged by the commercial court guidance, on which Tom will touch later, on proving foreign law and either agree or apply to amend pleadings or lead further evidence um, from experts. If they do not, they should be willing to concede or lose on that point. To allow parties to fill in the cracks of their case with a presumption allows the parties effectively to abdicate responsibility for their case. And I have to say I don't quite follow Professor Briggs's criticism of the presumption um, where his supposed, what, what he terms, English law polyfiller approach would produce much the same result in a conceptually different way. In essence, my criticism is of the result and his appears to be simply of the procedure. So, having said all that, does foreign law have to be pleaded? Well, you won't be surprised to learn that if you're relying on the default rule, the answer is no, as in Ramalpa. Uh, and the claimant, for, as we can tell from Iranian offshore, does not necessarily need to plead if they're relying on the presumption. Um, Brownlee number two, for example, the amended claim form did plead foreign law, but only in terms of a claim for damages pursuant to Egyptian law. That was the extent. Um, that is obviously much less than we would usually expect. And uh, a result of that is the risk that Lord Leggett points to. Uh, that you're entitled to do that, that's fine. Uh, but if you choose to do that, and later you want to um, rely on specific rules, just as in any other situation, you uh, take the risk that you're going to have to try and persuade the court to allow you to amend and to change your case. Uh, the risk, of course, being that you don't manage to persuade them. 
There's no special dispensation for a party who has previously chosen to rely solely on an evidential presumption. You also, of course, face the risk that the other side managed to persuade the court that this case is one where the application of English law will be just too strained or artificial to be appropriate. So, foreign law doesn't need to be proved. Again, unsurprisingly, if you're relying on the default rule, no. But even if uh, someone hasn't agree, uh, the parties haven't agreed to rely on the default rule, and one has failed to plead the consequences of the ap application of foreign law and failed to put the content of foreign law in issue, Iranian offshore supports the proposition that no proof is required where a party is relying on the presumption. Although, again, as with pleading, not proving foreign law is a risk. And um, Tom is going to talk a little bit about that and about proving foreign law. Thanks, Alina. Um, yes, I'm, I'm going to focus on how one goes about um, proving uh, the content of foreign law. Um, uh, but in light of, of both the judgment of um, Lord Leggett in Brownlee No. 2 um, and the more recent uh, commercial court guidance and some more weird and wonderful um, options developed by other international um, commercial courts... Um, so you'll see there, there are various, there's a menu of options available to you uh, to, to seek to prove the content of foreign law. Um, the first is the presumption of similarity, which Alina has looked at, and I'll come back to um, in, in, um, in a little bit. Um, the second is the, is the orthodox approach, which is by expert report, um, but it's orthodox both in England and in other common law jurisdictions. Uh, the third, a newer option, is via direct submissions from the parties by reference to the underlying source materials, be that uh, foreign statute law or, 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 or case law. Um, and then the remainder, which I'll come back to, are uh, some of the, the more novel options develop, developed by other uh, international commercial courts um, and posited by commentators such as Professor uh, Briggs. So, um, presumption of similarity, um, as with Alina, I'm, I'm not going to go into this uh, in as much detail as, as it probably merits, um, save to note that two justifications or several justifications are often uh, put in support of uh, what is in many respects a slightly curious uh, proposition. And the first is that uh, notwithstanding that all legal systems are going to be at some level different uh, to one another, there are said to be certain commonalities or, or general points, um, particularly in the commercial sphere, uh, that are uh, sufficiently general to, or common to all um, uh, systems of law, uh, that it, it's reasonable in certain circumstances to posit that English law uh, is going to be reflective of the foreign law position. Um, certainly that was the view of Mustill, uh, Lord Justice Mustill in, in the passage I have up on the slide. Um, and, and the second uh, uh, justification for the presumption uh, is relatedly that it's, it's, it's thought not to uh, to be sensible to put the parties to the trouble and expense of um, pleading and proving on the basis of expert evidence the contents of foreign law where there's no good reason to suspect that it's any different to English law. Um, as to uh, uh, the risks of relying on the presumption of similarity when one... Uh, so if one is in a situation where foreign law is certainly applicable, whether because the parties have agreed it's so or because the, the courts determined it to be the case, um, as Alina's noted, you, you can, in theory, rely on the presumption of similarity to establish the content of that law. Um, however, it's an extremely uh, risky approach uh, because notwithstanding the um, very careful and helpful survey of the jurisprudence by uh, Lord Leggett and Brownlee No. 2 uh, in the passages I have up there on the slide, um, it's still very difficult to predict in advance whether or not, at the end of the day, you're going to be able to, in, uh, to, to be entitled to rely on it. Just by way of example, you could probably do an entire lecture on whether, uh, in seeking to establish the content of foreign company law, one is able to rely on uh, allegedly analogous propositions of English company law. So, um, the orthodox way to prove foreign law, expert evidence... Um, uh, at least until recently, it was, it was the position, at least in England, um, that expert evidence was the only way uh, to um, prove the content of foreign law. 
Um, and so that would be the case even if, for example, uh, one uh, was uh, relying on propositions of BVI or Cayman contract law, which uh, one might expect are very similar to, to the equivalent English law. Um, the English courts did subsequently um, accept that it might be proved in uh, other ways, um, but they, very much the default position was proof by uh, expert evidence. Um, that was until um, the judgment of Lord Leggett in Brownlee number two, um, and, and particularly his paragraph 148. And I think it's, 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 um, it's not an exaggeration to say that at least rhetorically um, it marks a sea change in in um, uh, the flexibility that's afforded to the courts and the parties in terms of proving the contents of foreign law. Um, so it's sufficiently important that I think I'm, I'm going to quote a, 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 a bit from Para 148. So Lord Leggett says there, I would add that it should not be assumed that the only alternative to relying on the presumption of similarity is necessarily to tender evidence from an expert on the, the foreign system of law. The old notion that foreign legal materials can only ever be brought before the court as part of the evidence of an expert witness is outdated. Whether the court will require evidence from an expert witness should depend on the nature of the issue and of the relevant foreign law. In an age when so much information is readily available through the internet, there may be no need to consult a foreign lawyer in order to find the text of the for relevant foreign law. Um, so turning now uh, to the Commercial Court Guide, um, there's some very helpful guidance in there, largely drawing on um, Para 148 uh, from uh, Brownie number two. Um, I'm not going to uh, recite it for you, save to commend it to you. Um, then turning to the position in other international um, commercial courts. So interestingly, several years um, before um, Leggett's, uh, Lord, Lord Leggett's judgment in uh, Brownlee number no. two, there was a judgment of uh, the um, court of the Dubai International Financial Centre um, in the case of Fidel and Felicia, which um, substantially um, predicted uh, the substance of what uh, Lord Leggett said. Um, I'm, I'm led to believe that unusually uh, this, was, this was a case that went against uh, uh, Stephen Thompson, um, uh, although I'm sure he's not bitter about it. Um, so the, the substance of that decision uh, was um, to the effect that maximum flexibility should be afforded uh, to uh, the trial judge when uh, deciding how he or she wants to receive uh, the contents of foreign law whether that be by way of expert evidence or submissions or, or whatever else. Um, interestingly, um, the, the DFC court specifically rejected what it referred to as the English approach of having the default position being um, uh, 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 foreign law proved by way of expert report and said it preferred as a default position uh, what it termed as the international arbitration approach. So that is um, submissions uh, by the party's advocates uh, on the contents of the foreign law um, by reference to the actual sources themselves, whether it's, it's um, Sharia or um, foreign statute or, or whatever else. Um, and and, and, and uh, cer certainly subsequently that seems to be the position the DFC courts have taken. Um, so the second one is the Singapore International Commercial Court, um, which has been blazing a trail in terms of um, uh, more uh, interesting and radical solutions to the proof of the content of foreign law. Um, so since its inception, uh, the Singapore International Commercial Court um, has had a series of uh, foreign qualified judges. Um, it uh, has also allowed the direct submission by the party's advocates on foreign law, contrary to the um, position pre-Brownlee number two in England. Um, and it has also um, uh, uh, allowed ad hoc um, appearances by foreign qualified lawyers. Um, so that's interesting enough in and of itself. Uh, even more interestingly, um, two of the options up on this slide are for an order to be made uh, that the party should commence proceedings before the foreign court for declaratory relief on the meaning of the relevant foreign law. Um, I'm not aware of an order being made to that effect, but it's, it's certainly an interesting avenue. Um, and, and, and also, uh, the court itself may request uh, from the foreign court um, a, a binding opinion uh, on the, uh, the content of the foreign law. Um, again, uh, may well depend on, on the, whether or not the foreign court is actually willing to give that sort of opinion. 
um, but certainly probably useful as a marketing device for the, the, the Singapore International Commercial Court. Um, so I, I'm not going to trouble you uh, much further, save to note that when you are trying to prove the contents of foreign law in an interlocutory context, obviously most uh, importantly it's going to be in, a, in an application to challenge uh, jurisdiction. Um, in that context, uh, be very uh, aware of Mr. Justice Andrew Baker's warning uh, that you will always need to seek um, and obtain the court's permission to rely on expert evidence and the clear mood music of um, the commercial court following uh, Brownlee number two uh, is to think very carefully about whether or not expert evidence is actually required at all or, or whether or not you can just rely on the source materials. So just before we close, uh, we thought we should also quickly touch on two recent cases which seem to point in diametrically opposite directions on the issue of appealing foreign law. Um, so briefly, in Byers, the foreign law under consideration was Saudi Arabian legislation. There was reference to the Macmillan uh, distinction that I mentioned earlier. And uh, this was not a case where um, the court felt that there was any similarity um, because the regulations that they were looking at, the capital markets regulation and the company's regulation, were in Arabic. Uh, Saudi Arabian law is an Islamic system of law. Um, the concept and principles are far removed. Um, and the interpretation and application of those regulations also fell to be determined against the background of practice and culture um, which, with which the English courts had no inherent familiarity. So in that case, uh, the court found that it would have been wrong both in principle and impossible in practice for the judge to approach the task as one of interpreting the provisions for himself as a matter of construction. It would be equally wrong for the appeal court to seek to do so. And so they concluded that this court should be slow to interfere with the judge's findings of fact on Saudi Arabian law and should only do so in accordance with the principle, uh, principles applicable generally to finding of fact made by a trial judge who has based his, evidence, uh, his findings on evidence from the witnesses. Okay, that's, that's pretty orthodox. Um, nothing surprising. By contrast, then, we have Cassini, which is a decision made by the Court of Appeal a few weeks later and containing no reference to buyers, um, somewhat unhelpfully. The foreign law under consideration there was the French legal code. Uh, no one was suggesting that this was a case to which the sort of similar to English law qualification applied. So it was similar to buyers. But in that case, the court said, uh, OK, the the parties have agreed uh, that they uh, th that for findings of foreign law are different from other findings of fact and are not subject to the same restrictions on scrutiny by an appellate court. That's the agreement of the parties. But the court goes on to say, although an appellate court will bear in mind that the trial judge had the advantage of seeing and hearing the expert wit uh, witnesses and of clarifying their evidence directly with them, the appellate court is entitled to consider the expert evidence afresh and form its own view of the cogency of the rival contentions in determining whether the trial judge came to the correct conclusion. That is certainly so, where, as here, the appellate court has been provided with the reports and a full transcript of the evidence and cross-examination of the experts. Right. So, <laughs> um, this goes even further than a previous case from 2017, where Lord Newberger, in a case called Activist, um, said that yes, okay, um, we need to be careful about how we review, uh, but ultimately, although foreign law is a factual finding, it, it, rather than a legal con uh, conclusion, that is somewhat artificial. So in that case where a judge had not heard any oral evidence from the expert foreign law witnesses, uh, the Supreme Court felt that they were in as good a position as um, the trial judge to analyze the effect of the evidence as to foreign law. That is obviously quite different from a case which has run on the basis of expert evidence with cross-examination, and yet the Court of Appeal says, no, it's fine, we'll just look at it all again. 
Ultimately, the question of whether and to what extent an appeal court will review and interfere with a finding of foreign law and in what circumstances, therefore, remains wide open. Uh, and I understand that a couple of members of chambers are currently involved in a case uh, which will take this issue to the Privy Council. So it'll be interesting to see the outcome of that. So, very quickly, closing remarks. Tom, does the commercial court guidance and Brownlee number two mark the end of the foreign law expert? Uh, I think the simple answer is no, um, but I think expert evidence is going to be substantially less common as a result of Brownlee number two, not least because it's, it's a pain and it's expensive to put together a lot of the time. And frankly, in many cases, it's, it's not especially useful. Um, so, so, um, uh, but the longer answer is, is um, uh, I think the parties will need to give um, serious thought much earlier in the proceedings than, than perhaps traditionally they have to exactly how best in this particular case foreign law should be proved, um, whether it's going to be way, by way of submissions or expert evidence or, or, or some other way. Um, and I think I, I, perhaps a question for you is, uh, is, is, uh, is uh, foreign law a matter of fact? I think we can all conclude that uh, it's, it's clearly entirely dependent on what we're looking at. So why don't we just call it a matter of foreign law and leave it at that. Thank you very much indeed, Alina and, uh, and Tom. I mean, that's a fascinating topic, and uh, uh, certainly in many of the other jurisdictions where we operate, um, I think those concepts and questions are going to be adapted and uh, imported in, in very different ways, depending on how those courts operate. We uh, next have Bajor Shah and Kira King talking about the recent developments in the law on the duty of banks known as the quince care duty, a very important duty on uh, all banks in circumstances of potential uh, civil fraud. Um, and so I'll hand straight over to them. Thank you very much, Stephen. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, our session is going to be about the quince care duty. Now, before I get going, can I ask how many people are currently dealing with quince care issues or have recently dealt with quince care issues? Yep, a few. Excellent, excellent. Well, so th this, this topic it has become a bit of a, a, a hot topic. We've had three new cases in the last year alone, um, and there's been a plethora of, I think, about five cases in, in the last four years. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a burgeoning area, and I think it's one well worth examining because it touches on one of the key important things in our time, which is uh, customers being defrauded. Um, through, through, uh, by third parties. Now, what we're going to do today is this. Um, Kira is going to explain what the Quince Care duty is and its origins. I will then unpack some of the elements of that duty. And then we're both going to look at examples from the case law that illustrate where the duty has been engaged and where it has not. So the contours of where the law currently is. Kira. Thanks, Bajor. Um, so it probably won't surprise anyone that the quince care duty can be deri is derived from the case of Barclays Bank, PLC and Quince Care Limited. Um, and in that case, it was held that a bank owes an implied duty to exercise reasonable care and skill when executing its customers' instructions. And that includes not executing instructions if it has reasonable grounds to believe that there is an attempt to misappropriate funds belonging to the customer. And this duty is assessed against the standard of the objective at the ordinary prudent banker. So what the cases establish is that a bank will be liable if they execute an order knowing it to be dishonestly given, shutting their eyes to the obvious fact of dishonesty, or acting recklessly in failing to make the inquiries that a prudent banker would. Um, the duty arises out of the bank's duty of reasonable care and skill in executing the customer's instructions, and it arises by virtue of an implied term of the contract between the bank and the customer, and is also a um, duty arising in tort. And what is actually very interesting is that 
the quote that is on the slide is a quote from the Quince Care original decision. Um, and you can see that the, the quote states that um, trust was the basis of the bank's dealings with its customers and that full weight had to be given to this factor before one was entitled to conclude that essentially the duty was owed. But in the modern cases, for example, the cases that we're going to discuss um, later, it's very clear that, that that protection of banks has very much shifted and that the courts are now recognizing the role of banks in preventing financial crime. And the, the consequence of this is that the courts are more exacting now in assessing whether the banks have in fact breached their quince care duties. And, and so following on from that, um, the, the sort of following points I think can be drawn out from the case law. First, the, the quince care duty is essentially a duty about protecting the customer and protecting the customer um, in, in a particular situation. But it's not a general duty to protect the customer from fraud. No court has gone so far as to say that the bank is, if you like, the custodian of the customer. Actually, it's a very narrowly focused duty. It is focused on the payment instructions um, uh, that, that the uh, uh, customer gives to the bank. And, and the, the, as, as Kira mentioned, the, the, it, the problem with the Quince Care uh, uh, situation is that there, it, it posits a tension. There is a tension between the bank's obligation to execute a payment instruction, the mandate to execute the payment instruction, as against its common law duty not to do so if the particular circumstances in Quince Care arises. And so what the case law has said is that the um, courts have to fashion the duty in a very calibrated way. Now, the other um, aspect that, that this area throws up is, is another tension, which is that the common law is chary of imposing pure economic loss, and particularly pure economic loss um, caused by an omission which is what actually happens in Quinsca. That the whole point about the Quinsca duty is that the bank has failed to prevent a customer um, from, being def from losing their, their money. Um, one other interesting point is that the um, Quinsca duty is actually very separate from the bank's regulatory AML type uh, obligations. And the, uh, so far, the content of AML obligations have not actually informed the content of the Quinscare duty itself. So let's unpack some of the elements of Quinscare, um, the standard of care, and the standard of care in the case law is, is generally put in this way. Uh, what would an ordinary prudent banker do if put on inquiry that the payment instruction may be vitiated by fraud? And this is the point that the, the law does not want to impose too onerous a burden on the banks. Now, a, a couple of important points before we, we get into, the, uh, get, get into a, uh, the, the discussion of how one calibrates that standard. It, the, the banker does not need to have proof that there is fraud. The, the, the threshold is not set that high. Rather, it's are there circumstances that would cause a banker to be put on inquiry. That's the threshold. Now, how do you judge that? Well, it's going to require expert evidence of banking practice. What is the practice at the time that the transaction occurs? Um, what would a reasonable banker do when faced with the particular situations? And uh, banking codes are actually going to be quite relevant to voluntary banking codes are going to be relevant to that particular inquiry. I've put up a couple of the codes that, that have been referenced in the cases, the uh, Contingent Reimbursement Model Code for Authorised Push Payments that um, was adopted in 2019. So any push payment type frauds that occur, that, that code is going to be relevant in assessing what the level of the bank's duty is. Now, so much for the standard of care, let's look at one of the other aspects of any claim in negligence, and that's causation. Um, this is a, 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 an aspect of negligence, and therefore the standard causation question is asked. It's the ordinary but-for test 
um, that you find with all negligence cases. And the, the way it's often put in, in the cases is you ask the counterfactual scenario, which is what would have happened but for the breach of duty. Now, there's an interesting point that seems to have arisen in, in the cases. Um, normally, one would, one would ask the question in terms of what would the claimant have done if the bank had put um, the, the claimant on notice. But one of the more recent cases, which we will touch on, suggests that it, it's not just an inquiry about what the claimant would have done, but actually an inquiry about what the bank might have done as well. And, and that's why, therefore, I put on the bullet point, if the bank had alerted the customer, what would either have done? Because th there are circumstances when actually the bank itself may take the view that despite being told I must execute this um, payment instruction, I, the bank, know enough to know this is a fraudulent transaction, and therefore I should stop it. So it looks as if the causation inquiry is, is more complex than in a normal <coughs> Um, uh, uh, negligence case. You look at both the claimant and the defendant's actions. Um, and the obvious point, of course, these are very fact-sensitive inquiries. Um, rattling through, loss and damage. Um, now, the normal measure of loss is going to be the amount of money that the claimant has been lost by the breach of duty. Um, so if, for example, the whole amount has been, pay, has been paid out of the bank account because of the fraud, then the normal measure is going to be the whole amount. There's an interesting debate about whether consequential losses are, recovered, are recoverable. Um, they've not yet been tested by the courts. We, we don't know what the legal position is. In principle, um, there's no reason why such losses should not be recoverable. So a, a scenario might be this, that for example, there's money in the bank account, the bank knows that the, that the customer intends to use that money for a particular transaction. In fact, the money gets siphoned out, bank fails to stop it, the customer cannot go ahead with a particular transaction and, and suffers additional losses. In principle, those additional losses could potentially be recoverable. But, as always, one would have to look at the particular circumstances because as, as with all negligence cases, you need to consider questions of remoteness and, and, and the like as well. And then running through poten uh, potential defenses, um, contributory negligence, uh, yes, definitely available, but very much fact specific. Um, essentially, it, it, it seems almost that, that the way the courts have approached contributory negligence is not by looking necessarily just at how careless the claimant has been, but how bad the defendant's negligence has been. So it, it almost seems if, if the defendant's negligence is particularly severe, then even if the claimant has been careless, the amount that you discount the damages by is, is, is sort of reduced. At least that seems to be the flavor from, from the recent cases. Exclusion clauses, yes, like all negligence cases, you can always all, all, all duties in tort, you can always exclude a liability, um, but it's going to depend on the specific terms um, of your banking relationship. Um, the customer's own illegality. Now, th this is a point that has arisen in a couple of the cases where a an argument's been run that, that the, the person who carried out the fraud was, in fact, um, an employee or a director of the, of the actual claimant of the customer. And so an argument was made, well, can you attribute their fraud, their illegality, to the claimant themselves, and thereby bar the claimant from recovery? And um, the Supreme Court had, a, had, a, uh, had absolutely no truck with that argument and said, no, it doesn't work. So that is a, a, a rattle through, if you like, unpacking some of the elements of, of the uh, Quinn's care duty. Now what Kira and I are now going to do is we're going to look at a, a sort of few of the cases, some of the more recent cases, and draw out um, where the law has got to, which of the circumstances the law has found do fall on the right side of, of, a, of a claim and which, in, in which cases the claim is not made out. So Kira is going to tackle the, the, the first one, which is uh, Singularis. 
Um, so, Singularis was the, the first finding by the court in the 25 years um, from the establishment of the Queen's Care duty that the bank had actually breached its Queen's Care duty. And it's still one of the very few cases in which it's actually been held um, as a final judgment that the bank has been in breach of its Queen's Care duty. Um, on the basis of the facts of the case, it was held by um, Mrs. Justice Rose that a reasonable banker would have realized obvious glaring signs that a fraud was being perpetuated. Um, just to give you some more detail about the actual facts of Singularis, in this case, um, Mr. Al Sanea was the sole shareholder and principal director of the claimant, which was a company in the Saad Group. The defendant acted as the claimant's investment banker and held around $204 million for the claimant, who was a Cayman Islands company, and that was held in a segregated client account. The claimant was suffering very well-publicized financial problems, and what the defendant did was um, the, no, what the, what Mr. Alcinea did was instruct the defendant bank to make payments totaling $200 million from the claimant's bank account to various enti entities that were controlled by him. And the, the bank really put up no, no resistance to these demands whatsoever. Um, the payments were, were made without any investigations being made. Um, and where there were explanations as to why these transfers were required, they were inconsistent. And the effect of all of these payments was to reduce the, the claimant's account balance to zero. And then after that, unsurprisingly, the claimant entered into liquidation. And it was the liquidators who brought the claim against the defendant bank. So in the circumstances, the, the bank's lack of of care or the lack, lack of diligence in, in um, policing the instructions that were being given to it by Mr. Alcinea was extremely striking. And on the facts of the case, the defenses that um, Bajal has outlined, all of those potential defenses were run on the facts of the case. And in terms of the illegality defense, that was roundly rejected by the Supreme Court, that the, the dishonest conduct of Mr. Alcinea could not be attributed to the claimant. And similarly, a counterclaim for deceit was dismissed, and it was held that the loss was caused by the defendant's breach and not by Mr. Alcinea's misrepresentations. But what the court did find was that the claimant was 25% contributor, contributorily negligent. Um, and then the decision was upheld on appeal. But I think the, the striking thing about singu, Singularis is that the, the extent of the, the, the bank's negligence in all reality was just so striking that it was a very extreme case where the court actually found that the Quince Care duty was breached, and I think that's the most important thing to take away about the Singularis decision. Um, so the next case um, I'm going to talk about, uh, we're going to talk about is Philip and Barclays Bank. Very recent decision, I think, came out in May. Now, the circumstances of this case were particularly tragic. Um, the claimant, her husband and wife, were duped by a JW who convinced them that he was from the Financial Conduct Authority and that their bank account was in danger. And he convinced them to transfer their, pretty much all their life savings into some separate accounts, some 700,000 pounds of them. Um, it, the, the, the bank actually stopped one of the transfers, but, but JW had had such a hold on the claimant that they, went, they then went to another branch and effected um, the, the transfers of, of the money. And of course, the money was never recovered. Um, and so they sued the bank. Now, the bank applied for strike out or summary judgment on two grounds. One was that, one was on the causation grounds. They said that on, at, on the facts, um, you know, the, the payments would still have gone through no matter what the bank did. But, but the important point of principle that the bank ran was that the Quinscare duty 
only arises when it's the agent of the customer who is giving the payment instructions. So the normal scenario is where you have a company and then a company director, a fraudulent company director, is the one giving the instructions to the bank to make the payment. Their argument was um, Quinscare doesn't arise when it's the customer themselves who, are, who is actually making, giving the instructions to, to make the payment. That point succeeded at first instance, but the Court of Appeal um, reversed that. And the Court of Appeal said, certainly at the threshold of a strikeout or summary judgment, it is arguable that the Quinscare duty applies even when the instructions are given by the customer themselves. And, and the Court of Appeal's point was that Quinscare is not about um, a special agency relationship. It's just simply part of the normal banker's duty of care and skill in the service that they provide to their customer. So that's um, Philip and uh, Barclays Bank. Um, the, um, the next case that I'm going to, we're going to discuss is the Federal Republic of Nigeria and JP Morgan Chase Bank decision which, um, unlike the previous case, was good news for banks, although it's only a first instance decision, but it is a very, very well um, explained first instance decision. Um, the, the factual context of this case is, is quite complicated. It related to the payment of over $1 billion by JP Morgan Chase to accounts held by a Nigerian company called Malibu Oil and Gas Limited. And the Federal Re Republic of Nigeria alleged that JP Morgan had reached its Quinscare duty as it was on notice that the payments had been made to facilitate a fraud on the Federal Republic of Nigeria. And in terms of the, the background to um, this case, essentially it all concerned the granting of an oil production license in 1998 and there were various allegations of corruption in relation to the grant of that license. Um, what then happened was the license was revoked, there was a dispute between the parties which was settled in 2011. Then monies were put into an escrow account arising out of that settlement of the dispute and it was a payment out of the escrow account that was the, the payment in question for the purpose of this decision. And it was the payment out of the escrow account which was alleged to be made in breach of JP Morgan's quince care duty. And on the facts of the case, Sarah Cockrell did not find that there was actually a fraud. Um, and so the Federal Republic of Nigeria's case failed. But what she did do was go on to, dis to um, consider the quince care duty. And what she did um, was to focus very much on the precise circumstances of the case, and in particular, as to the, the precise payment instruction in question, and asking whether the bank was in, on inquiry in relation to that payment instruction, rather than being on inquiry generally because of generalized concerns about the parties that it was dealing with. <clears throat> and so, as a result, what the court held was that it wasn't of assistance to the claimant to be able to show that the bank was on inquiry generally. So it wasn't sufficient to say, well, this is the case when there was a huge amount of corruption, there were all of these... Um, unsavory things happening to do with the parties, what actually had to be shown was that this specific payment instruction was an attempt to defraud um, the Federal Republic of Nigeria and that the bank was on notice of that. And so the, the, the court also stressed that the, what had to be distinguished were high-risk features of a transaction which were relevant for your anti-money laundering procedures um, and the requirement to show that the bank was on inquiry and that these were two entirely separate things. And so on the basis of that, the court held that J.P. Morgan was in fact not on notice of any fraud in relation to the 2011 payment. 
And so what the, the case demonstrates is that the quince care duty is actually a narrow and constrained one. And if you're going to allege it, you need to make sure that you have evidence in relation to the, the particular payment um, that you are alleging should not have been made by the bank. If you don't have evidence that would have put the bank on notice as to that payment, general concerns are not going to be sufficient. So we have the Philip case that potentially widens the scope of the duty beyond agency principles, but we have the Federal Republic of Nigeria case that narrows the, the focus of, of the duty really on payment instructions and whether there's a fraud around the payment instructions. And then very recently, we've had a Privy Council decision on an appeal from the Isle of Man, a case called um, Royal Bank of Scotland International and JP SBC 4, which actually, again, narrows the scope of the duty. Now, the, 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 the facts of that case were these. The appellant, that's the uh, JP SBC 4, was a Cayman Islands investment fund. And it established a scheme whereby investors would put money into the fund, the fund would lend out to solicitors for um, high turnover, low value litigation, and then reap the profits from that. And the way the scheme was to work was that the funds were to be lent to um, an Isle of Man company, or rather to be given to an Isle of Man company, and the Isle of Man company would then make the loans and receive the payments. The money was placed in a bank account with uh, RBSI. Um, RBSI knew that the beneficial owners of that money were the fund, even though the actual customer, the person that had opened the bank account, was the Isle of Man company. The company was called Synergy Limited. Now, in fact, the directors of Synergy Limited were less than honest. Um, they they uh, uh, most of the money seemed to go to their friends and, and themselves. Some of it was lent to solicitors, but it seemed to be solicitors' <laughs> firms that the um, directors were involved in. Very little was recovered. And so the beneficial owner of the money, that's the fund, decided to sue RBSI, alleging a Quinscare duty. And in particular, alleging that the duty was owed not just to the customer, but to the customers, ben to the beneficial owner of the money, where it knew that uh, that was the case, and um, the Privy Council said no, the the Quinscare duties only owed to the actual customer themselves. Um, th th the Privy Council decision actually contains an interesting discussion of the underlying principles, and it is probably as good a place as any to start any investigation into this area of the law. Um, that is. It, that's our gamut through um, the extent of a bank's liability on Quinscare. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, uh, Bajil and, and Kira. Bang up to date, those uh, two most recent judgments both decided in the last, uh, last few weeks. So thank you for bringing us up to date on the, on the Quinscare duty um, and running um, so well to time. Um, Hugh. We have a talk from Hugh Mile uh, talking about uh, when a court will strike out a claim that has been brought uh, dishonestly or by dishonest means um, and in particular how we ought to approach the difficult decision of when and whether to apply for a strike out. Thank you. Thanks Stephen. Um, it will surprise a room full of litigators that unfortunately not all litigants are honest litigants. And some of the more cynical fraud lawyers among you might even venture to suggest that an unfortunate number of litigants are dishonest in some shape or form. Often, however, that dishonesty simply manifests itself as giving false evidence in support of a bad claim or bad case that is subsequently dismissed by a judge. But on occasion, a case will come along in which a claimant turns out to be advancing their case in a fundamentally dishonest way. What do we mean by that? Well, they might be somebody who has forged key documents in the case. They might be relying on documents that they know not to be true, even though they didn't create them themselves. They might be a litigant who has deliberately gone out and deleted or suppressed material before disclosure. Or they might have interfered with it by, as in one case, um, adding notes to their diaries, 
rewriting letters and slipping them into the files before disclosure is given to paint a very different story to the one that actually happened. Or they might even have given false evidence, but at an early stage in the proceedings, freezing injunctions, interim applications, that sort of thing, in order to gain a tactical advantage. And the question here is, what can you do about it? Is a defendant required to just sit there and take the conduct, or can you go to the court, and in particular, can you ask a judge to strike out the claim altogether on the basis of the dishonest conduct? Uh, and that is in the context, I think, fairly, of a system of justice which depends to some extent on a process in which each party is meant to come to court having openly and, and, and completely revealed the evidential material relevant so that the factual and legal issues can be determined. So if we start with the basics, uh, there is no question that the court has jurisdiction to do this um, and that the sort of circumstances we're talking about fall within it. Um, you don't really need to look beyond CPR Rule 3.4 for that. Uh, and it's, it's quite clear in all the cases that abusive process um, exists where you commence uh, or maintain a claim by dishonest means. Uh, you also don't need CPR 3.4, uh, and those of you in jurisdictions which rely on uh, previous rules or common law sort of uh, rules, uh, there is an inherent jurisdiction, certainly in the English courts, to strike out and control processes for abuse um, like that. So then the question is, how is the court going to deal with a case that comes before it? There are, arguably, three different approaches that you can draw out of the different authorities. There's quite a helpful article I've noted there by Professor Zuckerman about this in the Civil Justice Quarterly, uh, in which he discusses those approaches. The first is what we call the fair trial approach, and that is simply to say that the court should continue to hear the case wherever a fair trial is not impossible. So a defendant in that case would just have to uh, move on, provided the trial can take place, and presumably they would keep up their sleeve for cross-examination or costs later, the dishonest conduct. The second is a much more draconian forfeiture-based approach in which the court strikes out a claim even where a fair trial might still be possible, and it does so because the conduct itself is so sufficiently serious that the claimant is treated as having forfeited their right to be heard at all. The third option is sort of in the middle. Um, it recognises that looking simply at whether a fair trial is possible is not enough, uh, and it recognises that fairness itself, particularly in uh, modern civil procedure rules, um, means in including, it, it includes assessing the knock-on consequences of fraud and dishonest conduct, considerations such as whether an undue amount of time and money needs to be spent on the case, for example, further examinations, cross-examination, looking at documents, and where the misconduct will introduce that burden, the court must take it into account considering the needs of other litigants and so on and so forth. So it's, it's very much a sort of overriding objective inserted into the system. What do the cases say about which approach you should follow? The first case, which is quite a long time ago now, but it really led the way on striking out claims uh, for this sort of abuse, is the Arrow nominees case. Uh, this is a case in which one of the petitioners, well actually more accurately, one of the directors of a petitioner in an unfair prejudice petition had forged documents uh, before disclosure. This is the guy who changed his diary and put notes in and so on and so forth. Uh, an initial strikeout application was made partway through the case, but it was, it was refused on the basis the judge thought they'd got to the bottom of it and the trial could still go ahead. And the application was renewed at trial when it was discovered that the individual concerned had lied about the extent of his dishonesty. The judge decided not to strike out the petition because he thought the trial could still continue, and the Court of Appeal reversed that decision. Um, the Court of Appeal acknowledged in its reasoning that the fair trial principle is certainly a good starting point, but Lord Justice Chadwick went quite a lot further. He went on to introduce this reasoning, I've put it on the board, which seems rather more supportive of the forfeiture approach. So he said, a litigant who has demonstrated that he's determined to pursue proceedings with the object of preventing a fair trial uh, has forfeited his right to take part in the trial. His object is inimical to the process which he purports to invoke. He then went further and introduced the third concept. He explained that in the context of considering what is a fair trial, you have to look at a trial which is conducted without undue expenditure of time and money, uh, with a proper regard to other litigants, and ensuring that the finite resources of the court are not wasted. And he said this was a case in which the trial had been hijacked by the need to investigate the extent of the dishonesty and what documents were true and which were not. And Lord Justice Ward in that case perhaps took an even firmer line. He said that looking at a fair trial 
uh, was not possible was just too narrow. In the, in, it, it was too narrow a, a test. He said the attempted perversion of justice is the very antithesis of parties coming before the court on an equal footing. He said the case had become hugely expensive and wasteful by reason of the need to investigate the wrongdoing. He thought that the action in that case was a flagrant and continue, continuing abuse in front of the court and that striking out was therefore not disproportionate. Um, and he said that doing justice in that case meant to deny the petitioners the relief they sought due to their persistent cheating. Um, and he said the courts need to make it clear that this sort of scale and magnitude uh, of dishonesty will result in a forfeiture of the right to be heard. So that provides quite strong support for the forfeiture uh, and the hybrid models. The second case, slightly more recent, about 10 years later, um, was a court of appeal decision in Massoud. In this case, the judge, it was Peter Smith at first instance, decided that both parties were guilty of various forgeries and frauds and refused to strike out the claim. The court of appeal said the decision was right, but for entirely the wrong reasons. Essentially, uh, it was right because the application was not brought until trial, and they said it was too late to strike out at that point. Um, uh, but the decision is reported in part as a practice note, and it's quite helpful uh, in terms of guidance for other cases. The Court of Appeals said in Massoud that Arrow nominees is good authority for the proposition that where a claimant is guilty of misconduct which is so serious that it would be an affront to allow the case to continue, justifies the court uh, striking out even where a fair trial might still be possible. Um, but the problem with Massoud, and as that case makes clear, is that where a strikeout is sought at trial, it is very, very exceptional for an order to be made. And that is simply because at that stage, the money has been spent, the judge has the facts and the material before him or her, uh, and usually the correct approach is for a decision to be made on the claim, no doubt taking into account when considering the claimant's evidence, the misconduct that's occurred. Uh, and, it's, uh, and the court left no doubt that they thought such claims would always be dismissed. Um, and the other critical point that Massoud notes that's quite interesting is that the defendant's conduct is completely irrelevant. This is not a balancing exercise jurisdiction. So the defendant can act as badly as you like, uh, but it doesn't matter. The question you have to ask is, has the claimant by their conduct forfeited their right to be heard? Uh, and that's the only question that needs to be answered in that context. The third case is Summers and Fairclough, uh, which is a Supreme Court decision a couple of years after that. This was a personal injury case. Quite often these cases arise in that context where uh, the claimant had um, dishonestly exaggerated their injuries, but they did in fact have a good claim for some damages. The court, um, in fact the courts at all level, refused the strike out, concluding it would not be proportionate or just to strike out a claim where a judgment could be given for a properly assessable amount of damages. And they were in fact assessed at trial in that case. Um, it's helpful simply because it confirms the jurisdiction to strike out, including uh, in circumstances of dishonestly brought or advanced claims. It supports the Massoud decision and prefers it over a slightly conflicting Court of Appeal authority called All Hack. Um, uh, but it emphasizes the need to consider the overriding objective and looking at the Article 6 point that was raised in that case, uh, the, Court of Appeal remind, the, sorry, the Supreme Court reminded everyone that strike out has to be a proportionate uh, means of achieving a legitimate aim. Uh, but, but that's perfectly plausible when you're trying to control processes of the court against dishonesty. Um, it reiterated that a strikeout will be very rare indeed at trial, but it noted, helpfully, that the approach of a court where an application is brought much earlier in the proceedings will be very different, and that is because one of the objects of a strikeout earlier on is to stop the waste of resources um, where a claimant has acted in such a way that they might have forfeited their rights to be heard. So the question then for the last few minutes is, where does that leave us in terms of the decisions and practically how do we go about dealing with these sorts of cases when they come up? Well, in my view, I think you can see from the authorities that both the forfeiture approach and the hybrid model have got quite a lot of support. So if you do have a case where you have very serious conduct, there is certainly room to ask for a strikeout on the basis that the claimant has forfeited their right to have the case heard. The first issue, I think, practically speaking, is where are you in the proceedings? Um, it's clear from the cases that if you're at trial or close to trial, you're very unlikely to get an order at that stage. But of course, that doesn't mean you don't bring everything to the attention of the court uh, because it's going to be relevant for the evidential purposes at trial. It also raises a slightly more difficult question. How do you find out about the dishonesty at an early stage? Realistically, that might be something of luck or serendipity. Um, it, certainly in a case I'm involved in, uh, it, it happened because... Um, 
documents were relied on at the start of trial in a freezing junction application, which we were then able to uh, get information on through electronic methods, and it turned out they'd been created four years after the uh, date on the document and had been used dishonestly. Um, but often, even if you don't have that, one party, the defendant, will normally know if a document doesn't seem right in the suite, they might identify issues with it, they might say they've never seen it at all and don't know where it comes from. Um, and sometimes that happens, but sometimes uh, someone is able to say, well, look, I think this needs further investigation. And in those sorts of cases, if you can invest into investigations, IT, forensics, and that sort of thing, it may be worth doing so. Um, but I, I can't really go into the methods that might be appropriate, because that's probably another talk altogether. The second question is, how serious and extensive is the conduct that your client is facing? If it's a self-contained application in which the other party has lied, and there's no evidence to suggest further dishonesty, it's probably not going to be a course worth pursuing. Compare that to a case where the whole claim is predicated on a forged document, uh, or where there's been serious and persistent dishonesty in the disclosure process. Those are the sorts of the cases where uh, a strikeout is uh, seriously to be considered. The third question is, is there a substantial risk that the fair trial can't proceed? And that raises a question, well, how is the court going to know that? And the answer, I think, is that the application to strike out can, and I think in my view should, um, include requests for orders that the wrongdoer give evidence and be cross-examined on that evidence. And that is so that the court can investigate the extent of the deception. Uh, and that means the judge can un uncover the true extent of the dishonesty and whether it's still ongoing, or whether he's satisfied, he or she is satisfied that it's finished. Uh, and if not, a fair trial looks much less likely. And it also gives the judge a chance to end the case early, thus supporting the overriding objective. Connected to that is my suggestion that it's important to consider the knock-on effects of misconduct if the claim is going to continue. This goes to the fair trial point. By that I mean that in many cases dishonesty will have infected the claim more generally. So for example, it might be the case that, that the defendant will, with some justification, want to examine various other documents when they know that forgery has already taken place. That's going to require significant further resources of the parties and the court. Equally, the dishonesty often infects other people's memories. There was a point made by Lord Justice Chadwick in the Arrow case that witnesses often base their recollections on documents. And if an innocent witness believes that a document they've been shown by the claimant is a true document, notwithstanding that it later transpires it's a forgery, they are unlikely to be able to evaluate in their own mind the effect of that on their recollection of the event subsequently. Uh, and as Lord Justice Chadwick put it, the fraud is pernicious insofar as it infects the rest of the case. And those are quite strong points, I think, for uh, applying to strike out. Um, so ultimately, it seems that the courts are quite receptive to these sorts of cases, not, I suspect not least because they don't like to have their processes abused. In serious cases, the conduct, as I say, may be enough in and of itself, even if a fair trial is still possible. But it's important, I think, to put yourself, if you can, in the position to apply as early as possible, uh, if you think it's happening, and to ask the court for interim orders that are practically going to help you get there. So cross-examination, evidence, early disclosure, that sort of thing. And I should just say that there is quite a lot of academic support, certainly that I've seen, uh, and there's support in the case law for the forfeiture approach and for the hybrid approach. Uh, and I think it's probably quite justified as a matter of policy to say that claimants who try to advance their cases by perjury, fraud, forgery, uh, at least as a matter of basic principle, probably should receive a very tough time from the court. Hopefully that won't happen too often in your cases, but uh, if you're on the defendant's side, it can be quite fun. Anyway, so thanks very much for listening. That's the end of that. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Hugh. Um, interesting to uh, compare that sort of situation with the more common case where we've got dishonest defendants. Um, our final talk for today is another double-hander. Um, it's uh, Edward Cumming, QC, and Harry Samuels, who are going to be talking about the uh, growth of opportunities uh, that comes with the growth of environmental legislation. Over to you. The hot topic uh, of the day falls to me and Harry to talk about. Um, hot topic's not a very bad pun um, to draw on climate change and global warming. Um, it is because whatever your views may be on ESG investing, and I'm sure there are many different views in the audience today, uh, as I know there are amongst uh, different members of chambers, um, ESG, of course, if you're not familiar with it, being investing with a particular focus on environmental, social, or governance risks, um, is big business. 
Everyone's getting in on it. I saw the other day even Chuka Amuna, I don't know whether you remember him, he was a Labour MP and he was an MP for someone else and he was a Liberal Democrat and MP I think. He's now head of ESG for half the globe for JP Morgan uh, nonetheless. Um, it's very big business. There's more than 16 trillion US dollars uh, under management in ESG labelled funds. That is about one in three dollars that are under management worldwide. Um, and with that boom in ESG investing, there has predictably been a similar boom, uh, or there's increasingly a similar boom in ESG litigation. Now, it bears noting at the outset that that ESG litigation is not always focused on getting money for claimants. A lot of it is also focused on trying to influence one way or another business to change the way it conducts itself uh, by reference to particular perspectives on ESG goals and in particular of course at the moment um, carbon emissions in the context of potentially irreversible climate change. But Harry and I today are going to be focusing, you'll be sad to know, on money claims where people are trying to recover money from um, defendant entities. And in particular, what we're going to look at is where a firm's disclosures to the market are revealed to be incorrect, often through a high-profile scandal or some form of regulatory intervention. And there's then a resultant stock drop where there's a rapid fall in the firm's share price and that leads shareholders to seek to pursue claims to recover losses as a result of the drop. Now, there's been a marked increase in that securities litigation, as it's often termed in recent years, both worldwide and also in particular in England, something which I think is due to various factors. Firstly, the increased use in group litigation orders that are obviously a key component, often a key component in that sort of claim. Also, increasingly readily available litigation funding uh, and new uh, ways of getting capital into litigation that are now available. Um, and also the rise in claimant firms or claims managers who are actively seeking out these sorts of claims. So given all of that and the way in which uh, an increase in ESG focused investing has resulted in greater demand for and also greater scrutiny of the ESG disclosure that's out there, um, the risks of securities litigation as a result of inaccurate or unduly limited disclosure has probably never been more acute. You may uh, recall, just at the beginning of this month, there was uh, firstly a raid on the offices of DWS in Frankfurt, the big Deutsche Bank subsidiary, uh, and then shortly after that, there was the arrest of uh, the gentleman you can see uh, in the top left-hand corner, who was the C, sorry, the resignation, not the arrest, good grief, I'm going to get injuncted. <laughs> I'm not even going to say his name now. Anyway, there was the resignation of their CEO, who I won't name for obvious reasons, um, after the, the raid. What was underpinning the raid was um, a very clear concern that, that there'd been greenwashing going on, perhaps even deliberate greenwashing, which is the creation of reports about how fantastically environmentally friendly various uh, entities and potential investment opportunities are, uh, when in fact they may be mislabeled, to use a euphemism. And this is all taking place with an increase in the disclosure obligations on institutions and firms, uh, institutions and firms in London as a result of new regulations that are seeking to peel off the green mask to reveal uh, what may truly be within. Now, Harry, can you read out, given it's the final session, all the content of these reports for us, or, or if better, just give us a praise of it? Absolutely. I know that what everybody in this room wants, with only us standing between you and a drink, is to talk about the depths of government regulation. Um, so I will put it as briefly as I can and give you something of the who, what, when, where and why, although with a few of those missing. So what are the new regulations? Well, the government has, in has introduced and is on the verge of introducing further regulation, uh, basically to exceed what pre-existed its regulations in Europe. And those consist essentially of two interlocking parts. The first is something called the Sustainability Disclosure Requirements, or SDRs, and the second is something called the Green Taxonomy. Now, the SDRs are to be assessed against the Green Taxonomy, and in a nutshell, what they do is create a more objective way uh, of assessing the environmental... There we are, we've got the slide back. What they do is they create a more objective way of assessing the environmental compliance uh, of companies. And going forward, various entities will have mandatory reporting requirements 
against this country's new SDRs uh, by reference to the green taxonomy. So that's the what. I think that the big question for practitioners is the who and the when. So there are various different categories in the helpfully entitled uh, Greening Finance, a Roadmap to Sustainable Investing, which is catchily named. Um, but if you look within there, you can see which entities are caught and when they will be caught. Uh, in a nutshell, firms and corporate entities are caught already, with further mandatory reporting requirements to be introduced by the end of 2025. And there are currently live consultations on reporting requirements for all manner of other entities, including asset managers, the managers of FCA-regulated pension funds, occupational schemes, uh, and even financial advisors going forward uh, with a requirement that those advisors report their own compliance uh, with the SDRs. And the aim of this is very simple. It is that all of these institutions will publicly have available the percentage of their assets which are compliant with the SDRs and are compliant with the green taxonomy, with the aim that members of the public and scrupulous investors uh, may see how compliant their potential investments are with environmental regulation. So the final question that I'm going to answer is the how. And the how is primary legislation, which is a fairly large mallet to crack this extremely large nut with. But it is not just going to be secondary legislation or regulation or FCA guidance from henceforth. It will be done through the means of primary legislation, some of which has already been introduced in relation to pension funds uh, and which the government is planning more of uh, going forward. So that's an overview of these new regulations. Uh, some of the taxonomy is already in place, two of the six objectives. Four will be legislated for by the end of next year. So this is a real... Uh, this is a completely new set of uh, obligations for companies, which, in our view, is going to create uh, an avalanche, potentially, uh, of new environmental disclosure-related litigation. Um, so, Ed, what next? Well, the avalanche is only going to happen if the snow hasn't all melted already. That well, was a very joke true. That I couldn't <laughs> avoid. You'll have to forgive me. Um, if, if you breach the disclosure requirements, there's four broad consequences that might flow. There could be sanctions imposed by the FCA for breaches of listing rules or trans transparency rules or potentially on the grounds of market abuse. There's potential criminal liability on the parts of the people involved in um, the uh, disclosure or the non-disclosure. There's potential civil liability under general principles that we'll all be familiar with, maybe negligent misstatement, maybe um, contractual misrep claims um, that could flow. Um, and there's also the possibility of civil liability on the part of the directors who are involved to the company for not having um, properly discharged their uh, obligations as directors. But the particular consequences that flow civilly are going to flow inevitably from the particular nature of the, the disclosure or non-disclosure and the, um, the, the material in which the disclosure or non-disclosure happens. Um, and in particular, that's because of the specific legislative provisions in FUSMA, um, and there's two in particular that we want to focus on today, um, Section 90 and Section 90A. Well, under Section 90A and Schedule 10A, which is my favourite, uh, of FUSMA, the liability of an issuer, that's the firm, and the director of an issuer in respect of untrue or misleading statements or omissions in information other than a listing particular or a prospectus, such as annual reports, accounts, things like that, is limited to circumstances where there's been recklessness in respect to the statement or omission. Under Section 90, there's liability of an issuer in respect of untrue or misleading statements or omissions, in particulars and prospectuses, where there's mere negligence. Although, as Harry's going to talk to us about in a moment, there's a debate about whether that's going to continue to be the case or not. Um, so a key issue, as you can, so, so you can establish liability if there is um, the misstatement uh, in the right document. The key issue for a claimant, though, is so often the question of reliance, because it's very easy to show that there's a misstatement. It's much harder to show that a particular investor, at least historically, has relied on a particular misstatement in the prospectus. And perhaps if you think, for example, about the Tesco case of a few years ago where Tesco's accounts were misstated, that the misstatement was significant or material, material enough 
that actually even if the investor had been told about it, it would have made a difference to, um, to the investment decision that took place. Of course, what's really interesting in the context of ESG considerations is if the disclosure would have changed the ESG rating or changed whether the, um, the particular um, investment target appeared on a particular index or had a certain um, labeling by a certain ratings agency. Um, and where you've got lots and lots of policies, investment policies being introduced now that are almost tick box about ESG um, quality of potential investments, we think it's going to be a lot easier potentially to prove that you've got the necessary um, reliance. So, Harry, what, what were you going to say extra about different standards of knowledge? So this is a particular issue that arises under FUSMA as it's currently drafted. And it's important to be aware of what the claims constitute uh, and what potential defences are available in claims under these two particular statutory sections. And the one that I'm particularly interested in is that for section 90, there is a defence available, which is that the issuer had a reasonable belief in the truth of the statement that they were putting out. And what that in essence means is that at present, Section 90 claims uh, have to meet a negligent standard of liability because that wording is strangely similar to the liability for negligent misrepresentation in the Misrepresentation Act 1967. Now, by contrast, liability under Section 90A, as defined in Schedule 10A, Paragraph 6, uh, requires active uh, dishonesty or requires recklessness as to the truth of the statement that has been put out. So the key difference at the moment is that Section 90 requires meeting merely the negligent standard, whereas Section 90A claims will require meeting the higher bar of what has been called the fraud standard of liability. Now that's very important for claimants at present, but it's important to note that the Treasury has been consulting recently about whether that means that liability uh, under Section 90 is too broad. And the results of that consultation are in, uh, and it appears that the Treasury um, and the Department for Business, Enterprise, Innovation and Skills uh, is going to level the two uh, statutory provisions such that they both require now meeting the fraud standard for liability. But until that happens, and until legislation is brought in by the government, it does remain the case that it is easier to establish the requisite knowledge under Section 90, because all you have to do is meet the negligent standard, and you don't have to prove active uh, dishonesty or active recklessness as to the truth of a statement or omission. Uh, reliance and causation, I've um, rather um, fired my bullets before we got to this bit of the talk a moment ago, for which I apologise. Um, I will just mention two interesting features of, um, as far as I'm aware, the one case that's currently issued. There's an awful lot bubbling on in the background, uh, including ones that Harry and I are involved in. Um, but the one case that's issued under um, Section 90 or 90A at the moment uh, and is currently bubbling along in front of the courts, there was a decision in January this year where permission was given for expert evidence on effectively market flows and market practices. Um, in relation to uh, different disclosure announcements, which I think is a big step forward because getting that sort of evidence admitted is a very useful way of perhaps less active investors being able to demonstrate sufficient reliance and causation. And then in the same case, separately, directions were given for a split trial whereby the, the initial questions of whether um, the individuals with the relevant um, knowledge were PDMRs, persons um, directing, with di directing management responsibilities, a point Harry's going to mention in a moment, and whether the statements made were untrue or misleading was going to be dealt with first, with questions of reliance booted off to a separate trial. Whereas, obviously, reliance, from a defendant firm's perspective, is a very useful tool to try and get these claims knocked out at, at the first juncture. So I think that's an encouraging, uh, an encouraging um, development. So, PDMRs. PDMRs, I just want to say something very brief on this. Uh, as Ed uh, alluded to, the issue of PDMR uh, is another issue under FUSMA, uh, where PDMR stands for Person Discharging Managerial Responsibility, and that is uh, the class of people who are liable under claims under Section 90A of FUSMA. And there was a recent decision, which was the Allianz decision uh, on the screen, uh, in which that was interpreted, uh, as far as I'm aware, for the first time uh, in an English court. The facts of that case uh, aren't necessarily relevant, 
what is important is that the claimants sought to say that people who weren't strictly directors but executed positions and had senior positions within the company whereby they essentially directed and provided management for the company constituted persons discharging managerial responsibility for the purposes of section 90A. Whereas the defendant said, no, that can't be the case. They must be directors uh, or shadow directors or de facto directors in accordance with the uh, prior learning on what PDMRs mean from before a European regulation. So you have a broader view, which includes people who aren't strictly directors, and a narrower view, which only allows for directors to be liable. Uh, and this was a summary judgment application. Uh, and the court in that case decided that on statutory interpretation, the narrower view was to be preferred. So the court's indication there, and this is only a first instance interlocutory uh, decision, but the court's indication there is that PDMRs mean only people who constitute directors within the traditional understanding of that word. Uh, and so accordingly, the, the broader application, the broader interpretation has been discarded. But there's one health warning for that, which is, as I mentioned, that includes de facto directors. And so there is still a skirmish to be had about what de facto directors means in this context. So one could argue that the High Court has simply punted this down the road because summary judgment was refused on the grounds that there is a reasonable evidential case that these non-directors may in fact constitute de facto directors. So Allianz has provided some clarity, but not as much clarity as perhaps we might hope. We're rolling our sleeves up, as you can tell. Yeah. On that. Um, so, other potential claims, Harry, that, that my, might lie around um, an action under Section 90 or Section 90A and that you might want to bolt on as well. What about those? Yes, so the primary claims that claimants will be interested in are claims against the company directly, and those are the ones that we have outlined. But it's important to be clear that there are other uh, means of indirect liability uh, for directors. Uh, so, the, so directors have to be careful because there are traps lying around. So the first of these is liability under the Companies Act, uh, and specifically I'm thinking of liability under Section 463 of the Companies Act, which is one of those very well-known provisions, of course. Um, what that means is that directors uh, can be made to pay up in circumstances where their own omissions uh, or false statements in a series of reports have caused the companies to suffer loss. And those reports are the director's report, the strategic report, the director's remuneration report, or the corporate governance statement, uh, all of which are deeply exciting documents. In those circumstances, the company itself can sue the directors to recover the losses that the company has suffered as a result of those misleading statements, perhaps as a result of the claims that we have previously outlined. But it's important to note that that list of potential reports which can incur liability is a limited one. There are other environmental reporting requirements incumbent upon directors, uh, such as uh, the Companies Act regulations, which require uh, various greenhouse gas emissions to be reported, uh, and also uh, what I have noted down as the catchily acronymed LMSCG brackets ARR 2008, which is the Large and Medium-Sized Companies and Groups Accounts and Reports Regulations 2008, which imposes an absolute mass of environmental reporting requirements on directors. So the Section 463 uh, liability is itself limited, and there may be other avenues for suing directors. Now, one of those which is now on the screen is Section 172 of the Companies Act, which I'm sure everyone in here will be aware of uh, as the duty incumbent upon directors uh, to promote the best interests of the company. Uh, and I think that Ed has perhaps something to say about that. I don't have very much to say about it at this point in the day. I think it's very ambitious um, uh, for a claim uh, in this respect. Um, and you will also all be aware of the very recent case suggesting that it's only enforceable practically 
by the company against its directors rather than the suit even of, of shareholders. Um, and then there's the possibility of an unfair prejudice petition, which uh, I think I can probably reveal Harry's been asked to opine on um, in the not too distant past in circumstances uh, of alleged um, inadequate uh, disclosures by uh, directors, direct shareholders of um, ESG related matters. Did you, well you probably can't talk about the specific advice, but would you be enthusiastic about more advice in that respect, Harry? Well, I'm of course enthusiastic about being asked to give more advice, but my enthusiasm for the claim is fairly weak, I have to say. So, we will conclude with just a few thoughts about um, where there might be particular scope for caution on the part of financial institutions in relation to the new disclosure regime that Harry's talked about, uh, and also where there may be scope for uh, particular scrutiny that could uh, bear claims. Um, so, the, the bottom line is, obviously, the most important thing in any sort of transparency regime is to be earnest and to be straightforward. Um, and as part of that, boilerplate language is unlikely to assist you very much in saying that you've discharged your liabilities. Um, above and beyond that, disclaimers could actually positively be the enemy of a financial institution because it could suggest that um, well, it could fundamentally undermine more specific disclosure that's made and ought properly to be made. And it may suggest that there is um, a lack of more detailed knowledge and awareness on the part of the institution, and obviously key figures within it, PDMRs, uh, than is in fact the case. Sort of associated with that, um, where it's probably going to be sensible to be transparent as to the shortcomings, perhaps um, counterintuitively, as to the methodology that's being pursued in obtaining and aggregating climate-related data uh, for the purposes of the disclosure. Um, there may be a temptation in certain instances to be uh, very precise and say, well, look, we've done all of this, isn't it great, and aren't we a fantastic uh, ESG-compliant business? But that might be a, making an assertion with much more confidence and can, in fact, be borne by either the data that you've established uh, or the processes that you've followed to gather it and to analyze it. So I think looking at um, the methodology, being frank about what it is and being frank about its potential shortcomings is probably a sensible route for institutions to take and it might be a flag if they haven't done that in their disclosures. And then also I think the same, a similar consideration applies in respect of forward-looking factors. Uh, in other words, things, projections about the future that are the premise of the calculations uh, and the methodology that have been adopted. Um, and then finally, and again, connected to the, the general theme that, that I've just been outlining. Um, there needs to be a care generally with metrics. They can be important, they can be useful, but they're only as important as their limitations. But again, the extent to which um, institutions are going to be comfortable um, revealing uh, and commenting on uh, these features remains to be seen as everyone grapples with these brand new, um, new um, requirements. So I think... That is effectively all we had to say, apart from the fact that this is obviously a brave new world that we're going to be encountering more and more. We have, I think, perfectly managed to time ourselves a little bit short, so there's scope for questions. But as we were anticipating with the background on this slide, uh, we're going to suggest probably, if Stephen Thompson will let us, that we suggest we take them informally over a drink outside. Thank you all very much. Thank you very much. <laughs>
BD manager who did so much effort putting this uh, talk together, and Paul Horsfield, who's our head of clerking, who insisted that I thank him. Um, and uh, and uh, I should also mention that the slides for all of these talks, I think, will be available on the website. And if you really want to watch the whole thing again, or any of it, I think Andy might even send you a link to YouTube. No doubt you'll have many colleagues who will be desperate to see it, having missed today. So drinks are downstairs in the marquee, um, and we'll see you all down there. Thank you.